Note, there is a slight possibility that the soldiers which this man encountered were not human marines, but we will deal with this bizarre possibility later on, Branton. These people brought these little characters on gurneys, okay? They had big heads and little bodies and they went into this little room. Then, behind them, these doctors in white coats and stuff. And we was really it uh. We didn't know what the hell was going on. We were shocked to hell. I was scared man. Gee, well, sure you didn't know what was going on and didn't expect it. I guess them handling you upset you first of all. Being man to man, you thought why should you treat me this way? And that's to be expected. As far as knowing where you are I have no idea. See, I know where I was. I work there every day. I keep a log and if someone asks me I know what's going on. I'm telling you man they were not telling us the truth. There is something damn wrong within our government. I only got a glimpse of this scientist on television that is most likely referring to Robert Lazar, Branton, but I know he's not telling much of what he knows. I'm just a worker. A hammer and nail man. This guy's got more brains than I do, and we know more about it than I do. There's something inside they aren't telling us. Gee, okay I understand that. Now what do you want us to do about it? C. Expose IT. Gee, I think you've done that yourself, just now. Now you haven't told us your location and I think that's important so we have some idea where this is. I hope you understand at this moment. C. I work at Mercury, Nevada and I'm the best electrician there. This is between you and me now. I don't want anybody else to know about this. Gee, but you're on the air sir. C, you mean somebody knows about this besides you and me? Gee, but you were talking over the radio, sir. Everybody, all over the west coast that is listening has just heard you. So you've gotten your word out. Now let's see if anybody else knows about it. Maybe just maybe, we'll get some calls from some of the people that work with you. C, wait a minute. You mean somebody else knows about this beside you and me? Gee, now, this is a talk show, you called a talk show. I am over the radio, that's where you called. C, oh, my god. Gee, why, what's wrong with that? You called a talk show. C, I thought I was just talking to you. Gee, now you said someone told you to call me. Was it someone you work with? C, yes. Gee, nobody knows who you are. You haven't said your name or anything. Now, let's see if anyone will back up your story. See, but I didn't know other people would hear this. Now I'm scared for my life. There's tremendous stuff out there that's being hidden. It's being corrupted inside. It's being stashed away. Gee, well that's what we do here. We are trying to bring the information out, and it's people like yourself who are making that happen. They bring us information all the time. Are you trying to bring the information out yourself because you don't like what's going on? See, I fear for my life because I've seen what happened. I fear for my life because the government is lying to me. Gee, okay why do you fear for your life? Have you been threatened? See, before you even go down in the pit they threaten you. That is you tell anything of what you saw, you were dead. Gee, but you're not saying more than what you saw. Is there anything else you want to say before we say thank you for calling? C, yes, one other thing. Whenever it gets down to the nitty gritty, it will be clear to the people, that what they are seeing on the news, is true. We've got six little bodies underground, man. G, please keep in touch, okay? End of transcript. The reference to Reynolds Electrical, by the way, may be explained more fully in its connection with for example and G, from the following reference which we quote, from an article that appeared in a newspaper called The Review Journal. January 9, 1990. This Associated Press article stated, three Nevada-based for example and G companies employ most of the workers at the Nevada test site, the nation's nuclear proving ground 65 miles northwest of Las Vegas. The companies employ 8,000 people, 1,500 at for example and G Energy Measurements Incorporated, 1,000 at for example and G Special Projects, and 5,500 at Reynolds Electrical and Engineering Company. Actually, Present officials working at the Nevada test site are apparently, at least for the most part, refusing the advice of the founder of for example and G. Harold Doc Edgerton, who once made the following statement at a meeting of the Archaeological Society of America, work like hell, tell everyone everything you know, close a deal with a handshake, and have fun. Edgerton apparently was no supporter of official secrecy.
Yet many of those now involved in this company are being threatened to remain silent to the point of endangering their very lives if they speak out about what they have seen. Incidentally, Robert Lazar was hired by for example and G himself to work at the S4 installation at Groom Lake. In fact, we will now relate another conversation which took place on the Billy Goodman happening almost a week following the conversation which is recorded above. There are apparently some employees working at the Nevada test site who are speaking out about what is going on there, like the one who called into the Billy Goodman show on November 24, 1989, possibly in response to the caller from Mercury, Nevada mentioned earlier, as well as in response to Bob Lazar's own experiences. The person who transcribed this particular tape program indicated that they had missed the first 15 seconds or so of the caller's conversation. This is not the same caller whose conversation we just described. In the following transcript, C indicates caller. G indicates Billy Goodman. And L refers to Bob Lazar, who was Goodman's guest for that evening. Beginning with the caller, C. Well, we were kinda fed up with what's going on, right? And I mean nothing gets done without the ants. We are the ants. We are the construction workers, okay? We put things together and take them apart. You are the scientists referring here to Robert Lazar, Branton. You do all the higher level of knowledge stuff, right? We do all the putting in this and putting in that, installing, construction and so forth. Well we heard about your situation, and it's going through a whole bunch of grapevines, oh. K. It's coming together where people are meeting in small groups and they're trying to organize a support for you to back you up. Out of the meeting we had yesterday of seven people, counting myself there are two that will come forward and support you. What they saw, what they are involved with. The other guys are just scared to death and I'm a little scared myself, you know. L. Do these people work in Area S4? C. Yeah, all over the area. L. That would be great. C. Mostly underground. The deep sections of the area. The whole thing. Gee, how do you feel Bob? Sounds like you were getting some support. L, yay, that's great. There's power in numbers. C, we are trying to get things where it will be safe. You know what I mean Bob? L, oh yeah, I do. C, it's kinda hard to talk to you like this you know but the guys are for you. People are for you and everybody's wanted to do something a long time ago but nobody knew what they could do. L. Yeah, that was the consensus when I was down there. Everybody wanted to do something. I'm glad everyone has that attitude. C. Yeah, you were probably the beginning of the first motion of the wheel you know. The first turn. The wheel is gonna turn faster and faster in order to get where we want to get to. L. Well hopefully that will be the case. Do you think these people would come forward if there was some sort of congressional amnesty for them? C. I don't know but we all know a lot. We know our jobs well, like you do. L. I'm sure you do. C. What we have to do is be firm about it, get to the point and say, hey, here's what's happening. Why don't you tell the people what's happening? Why keep it a secret? Like before you walk into those hangars there. Somebody had to install this and install that. It's frightening. It scared the heck out of me. We got together out at Lathrop Wells and kicked it around. We bees. At a little bit and said, we gotta do something. So we did something yesterday. Like I said, there's only two of the seven of us who are willing to do something. Gee, sir, sir? Is there anything we can do to help you in this matter? Is there anything the listening people can do? I know they are behind Bob Lazar 100%. I had him on here one night and there hasn't been one person by either mail or by telephone who has disputed what he has said. So they are behind him. Is there anything we can do? C. Well you could form some kind of walk or picket. Or announce it on the street. Tell them we want to know. We want to know. G. When you say on the street, are you talking about downtown Las Vegas? C. Yes. G. What do you think of that Bob? Do you think that would do anything? L, certainly if these people come forward. They have a lot to lose, if people start making a ruckus like that. They could lose their jobs right away. They talked about there being a 10-year jail term and a $10,000 fine for divulging information like that. I mean they have a lot to lose. You might. Gee, but you know something Bob? It's almost like. C, we have the First Amendment on our side. L, yeah, you do but. Have you thought about contacting George Knapp? 
of Class TV, Las Vegas, who produced an entire series of UFO-based documentaries after Lazar came forward with his story. Branton, he's looking for anybody that is coming forward from S4, and any surrounding areas having knowledge at all about that area, or any of the flying saucer information. He's gathering all he can, and doing a lot to try and expose it. Gee, you might want to contact George. That might be a good idea. But I think there's another side to this. It's almost like they're not concerned anymore about their jobs. They're more concerned about the Constitution. They're more concerned about humanity. That's the impression I get. L, yeah, you get that point but you have to feed yourself too. Gee, well you know, there are people that take chances in life, and sometimes they wind up with something better. Later on. Down the line. You know what I'm saying? Someone like yourself. I'm not saying this would happen by coming forward, taking a chance, and all of a sudden, say, the government cut you off? You might get an offer for a better position. You follow what I'm saying? Because there are people who own the businesses that believe the way you believe. And I believe this. I hear this gentleman talking, and it's happening more and more. There are people out there who would love to come forward with information. See, but somebody has to start it. Gee, right. And I think you've done that Bob. You started the ball rolling. I know you did. I think what is going to happen is the people who have been wanting to say something. This might be a relief for them. It's coming out and they won't have to keep it inside anymore. L, that was the general consensus when I was out there. G, well obviously they want out too. They want to tell the truth. C, Bob, did you have any work underground? In the tunnels? L, no. I have a friend whose dad worked on some of the drilling equipment. I know there's some tunnels down there. C, there's more than just tunnels down there. There's everything you can imagine down there. I know cause we put it up. We installed. We did everything. I just want you to know that the M.W.S. Mercury workers are gathering together in small groups trying to put something together for you and contact you somehow to join you. If the people want to join us in a march or whatever it's going to be, that's what we're going to do. L. O. That's super. C. So we're with you man. G. Thanks for the call sir. Have a nice night. Bob. It sounds as though people are starting to come forward. End of transcript. Still on the subject of the strange events taking place in and beneath Southern Nevada, we quote here part of a letter written by a subscriber to NAR Nevada Aerial Research, now leading edge research, who made the following statements. Bob Lazar, the scientist, was talking about riding in a bus with the windows blacked out and it brought back something an airline stewardess told me last summer, 1989. She said, I'm trying to relocate to another part of the country right now. Once a week, I'm assigned to a flight that I hate. We only have armed forces officers on this flight. Before we take off, we are instructed to pull the window covers over the windows. After we take off, we circle widely, about 15 minutes. It would be unnoticeable to most people. Fly straight for 15 minutes, circle again about 15 minutes and then land. After we land the flight crew is ushered into a lounge. A half hour later we repeat the process back to Las Vegas. The people are all different on the return trip. We are told, don't tell anyone about these flights. I just can't stand the tension on this flight. Note, just what did she mean when she says the people are different on the return flight, different people are the same people with different personalities? Branton. I think these trips are to Groom Lake. The jets are still swarming over the Blue Diamond area. It's very odd. I know in my heart that it's more than just practice flights. Something else very odd, I think this might have something to do with the tunnels. The apartment complex where I work, fourplex is minus 450 of them. Two or three days ago the manager asked the maintenance men if any of them were doing any work in one of the buildings. Everybody said no. She said all four apartments in that building had called her and said that an explosion knocked all the pictures off their walls and broke them. No one else, from any other building felt anything. The man I said who saw the landing at Hollow Man beat a path to me to tell me about this. A Las Vegas subscriber. In addition to this, here is another item which appeared in one of the NUR newsletters. On November 25, 1990, television station Channel 8 in Las Vegas televised a two-hour special on UFOs, Area 51, S4 and the UFO cover-up. It is revealed that some of the people who contacted Channel 8 had had their homes broken into in Las Vegas. 
Could Channel 8 have an infiltrator working among them? Branton. Also, the following information appeared in the NER newsletter, under the heading, Intelligence Report, also in reference to the UFO military connection, NRO, National Recon Organization, based at Fort Carson, Colorado. Responsible for all alien or alien craft connected projects. Use on marked black helicopters. Delta, security teams from NRO specially trained to provide task project slash Luna security men in black. This project is ongoing. Blue team, the first project responsible for reaction slash recovery of downed slash crashed alien craft and door aliens. This was an AF material command project. UFO sightings of craft accompanied by black helicopters are red light assets that originated at Groom Lake, Greenland, Area 51 north of Las Vegas. Projects, Blue Team, Sign, Grudge, Aquarius, Cigna, Pluto, Snowbird, Luna, Gabriel, Excalibur, 1988. Note, these are some of the secret projects allegedly relating to the, the United States government's interaction with the UFO phenomena. Further details on these projects are available from Leading Edge Research. P.O. Box 481-MU58. Yelm, Washington, 98597. Although LER carries much documentable information from very reliable sources, the reader should be warned that they also carry some occult channeled information which may be of an extremely dubious nature, information that cannot be physically substantiated. But the documentation it does carry is extensive and very well compiled, Branton. The intelligence report segment in Nurler also revealed the following information concerning former naval officer Bill Cooper. Bill Cooper recently received some strange phone calls in which the following statements were made by the caller. I called to tell you that you were wrong about the alien base. Luna is the name of the base on the far side of the moon. The Earth base is called Dreamland. You were in over your head. Would you like to end up in an asylum? If you continue your activities you will meet me sooner than you think. You should know who I am. Bill Cooper has some comments. We will print them, when I release Public 02. Doc, release of info on computer bulletin board. My purpose was to expose the documents and information released by William Moore et al. as being fraudulent and misleading. Majestic 12 is an advisory team of scientists whose only purpose is to evaluate information and make recommendations. The information gathered by the control group Magi is released to Majestic 12 when study is needed. Majestic 12 has never been the whole truth. Magi is the Majestic Agency for Joint Intelligence and has total control of information and interface with the aliens and dealings with the United States government. Some of the documents released by Moore were changed from the original with the deliberate intent to mislead UFO researchers. I believe that the government is behind the whole thing. The rest of the documents are deliberate frauds. Magic is the highest security classification in the nation. Other above top secret security classifications reportedly include the Q, E, MJ, and Ultra classifications, Branton. The following information from William F. Hamilton 3 appeared in UFO Universe and describes further details on the Yellow Fruit account, including claims which F. made over the air during the few interviews in which he took part on Kvedge Radio's Billy Goodman talk show. Yellow Fruit revealed that a conflict was going on between the Benevolent Ones and the Ebs and that now the Benevolent Ones had gained the upper hand at Dreamland where he said a contingent of 37 Benevolent Ones were stationed and where three Ebs were held in captivity. Bizarre. Science fiction? Yellow Fruit knew a lot about the test site area. I resolved to go to the location he gave of the Ebb installation in Deep Springs, California and then on to visit Pat at the Rachel Bar and Grill to make contact with Yellow Fruit, the name for the first level of security force at Area 51 and also the name of an old Army CIA unit. The second level of security he called Sea Spray and intimated that you would have an encounter of the unpleasant kind if you ever met with them. Colors to the Billy Goodman radio happening had already organized trips to mile marker 29 and one half on Highway 375 where a dirt road left the highway to intersect the road to Dreamland. There was a heavy blackmail box on this road, which identified it. I got to Rachel early one October morning and left my card with Pat at Rachel's bar and grill to pass on to Yellow Fruit. She knew him by sight. I then inspected the dirt roads where people stood to observe the test flights. I had already interviewed four witnesses by phone who testified that they had seen UFOs over the Groom Mountains on certain nights in the same area they were seen by John Lear. I made a second trip to the area in late October where a public group visited Rachel and that is when I saw the mysterious yellow fruit in the cafe. He later called me on the phone. 
I left him with a copy of my book, Alien Magic, and he remarked on the research I had done concerning the search for underground bases. According to Yellowfruit and others there are underground bases and tunnels that conceal the activities of the aliens and secret government projects. The following is an excerpt from an article which appeared in a UFO-related publication. We do not know exactly who the author of the article is, but we relate the excerpt as it was sent to us. Lear directed my attention to a large map of Nevada, which delineates all the areas which civilian maps coyly leave as uncharted military preserves. Right in the very center is a place called Area 51. It is our most secret complex. There are 1900 people there, it takes presidential clearance to work there, and they are ferried in by aircraft in the morning and taken out about 5 o'clock in the evening. They have nothing to do with the saucers. The people who work on the saucers go up later in the afternoon and go home about midnight. The saucer facility is called S4. S4 is in the southwest corner of Area 51. Unfortunately, this facility, and a similar setup near Dulce, New Mexico, may now belong to forces not loyal to the, the United States government, or even the human race. It's horrifying for us to think that all the scientists we think are working for us are actually controlled by the aliens. Here, Lear seems to contradict himself. He speaks of aliens, plural, in a controlling capacity, whereas previously he noted but one survivor, kept as captive. He resolves this conflict by describing an alleged landing at Holloman Air Force Base on April 24, 1964, our first diplomatic contact, as it were, with the visitors. Note, in addition, this writer does not take into account the apparent subterranean connection and origin of many of the alien beings, which has been alleged by many sources and which would explain the large alien influence or presence in Nevada and elsewhere, Branton. According to Lear and other sources, the 1973 Robert A. Maynegger documentary UFOs, Past, Present and Future presented a thinly fictionalized version of this event. Government contacts allegedly provided the filmmakers actual footage of the meeting, which, alas, was withdrawn at the last moment for as yet unspecified reasons. A deal was made with them in the latter part of the 1960s. Note, as we've indicated earlier, this might have been a revisioning of an earlier treaty, as certain sources claim that these treaties go back to the 1930s, if not earlier. Some of those involved in this deal may have had good intentions, since the Greys presented themselves as evolved space brothers who only wanted to help us. John Lear even alleged that huge underground bases were constructed with the help of the Greys, yet when completed, the Greys did an about-face and took control of not only the lower levels of these bases but also the mechanisms which were supposedly given to the government as part of the deal. This is about the time that the wars began within the subterranean system itself, near the time when the so-called grand deception of the aliens was discovered, Branton. In exchange for technology, we would cover up the existence of the aliens. Apparently this agreement, engineered by an arm of government so covert that even the president may not be on the need-to-know list, also sanctioned the abduction of humans, which the aliens rationalized as an ongoing monitoring of a developing civilization. We asked only for a list of the abductees. In 1973, the deal soured. Hundreds of people, thousands, were being abducted that weren't on the list. In 1978-79, there was an altercation between us and the aliens, in which they killed 44 of our top scientists, and a number of Delta forces who were trying to free them. I'm not sure where this altercation occurred, it could have been Dulce, note, probably Dulce, as the term Dulce Wars which has been referred to by different sources, would seem to indicate. Also, there is some confusion as to the 66 and 44 numbers. Paul Benuet says that 66 special forces were killed in an attempt to set free some of our scientists from the aliens that had taken them captive, whereas 44 escaped. Whether the 44 were stormtroopers or scientists is uncertain, although most sources state that the scientists did not make it out alive. Banuitz claims that the 44 did not die but escaped instead. Since some report that the scientists were not set free it may have been that 100 special forces were sent in, 66 of them being killed in the attempt and 44 escaping the alien counterattack, Branton, or it could have occurred in Groom Lake. Robert Lazar has stated that a similar confrontation between the aliens and human security did occur in the bases below Groom Lake, Branton. This battle, Lear claims, left us bereft of our own facilities. Ever since, we have attempted to create a counterforce to meet the alien challenge. Note, in other words, 
The aliens invaded and took control of the underground bases, probably from below, and killed many of the top scientists in America, destroying much of our ability to defend ourselves, at least technically, from their ongoing incursions. Branton? The Strategic Defense Initiative was one such scheme. SD, regardless of what you hear, was completed two years ago. That was to shoot down incoming saucers. The mistake was that we thought they were coming inbound, in fact, they were already here. They were in underground bases all over the place. It seems that the aliens had constructed many such bases without our knowledge, where they conduct heinous genetic experiments on animals, human beings, and improvised creatures of their own devising. The following information was released by Leading Edge Research and describes some additional details concerning the serpent race slash greys based upon the findings of several researchers who have pooled their investigations in order to find out more about this apparent enemy or nemesis to humankind. The following scenario emerged from this cooperative effort. Emphasis hours, Branton, notes on elf alien life forms, term used by the government to describe the greys in terms of being a malevolent life form. The deal with the greys is that their field around their body is different from ours to the point where merging of the fields ends up creating physical symptoms, the body terror mentioned by people like Whitley Stryber. The field around them is in direct opposition to ours. IT is an anti-life field. They are experts of manipulation of both the human body through manipulation of the fields and the human mind. They require blood and other biological fluids to survive. They abduct humans and animals in order to acquire these fluids. Vampirial in nature, Branton. They implant small devices in the brain which potentially gives them total control and monitoring capability. These devices are very difficult to detect. The analysis of the devices by technical staff has produced a description that involves use of crystalline technology combined with molecular circuitry and these ride on the resonant emissions of the brain and the various fields of the human body. Information is untrained on the brain waves. It appears that all attempts to remove the implants 1972 have resulted in the death of the human. They perform surgery and other operations on human subjects. These abductions continue to be an ongoing matter. A list of abductees is provided periodically to Magi, although IT is known that many more are abducted than are reported. Various descriptions of the ALFs relate the following characteristics, between 3 to 5 feet in height, erect standing biped, Small thin build, head larger than humans, absence of auditory lobes, external, absence of body hair, large. Eyes slanted approximately 35 degrees, which are opaque black with vertical slit pupils, arms resembling praying mantis, normal attitude, which reach to the knees, long hands with small palm, claw-like fingers, various number of digits, often two short digits and two long, but some species have three or four fingers, tough gray skin which is reptilian in texture. Small feet with four small claw-like toes. A non-functioning digestive system. Two separate brains. Movement is deliberate, slow and precise. Alien substance requires that they must have human blood and other biological substances to survive. In extreme circumstances they can subsist on other cattle, etc. animal fluids. Food is converted to energy by chlorophyll by a photosynthetic process. This supports results gained from autopsies at 29 Palms underground base where it was seen that their blood was greenish and the tissue was black. Waste products are secreted through the skin. The two separate brains are separated by mid-cranial lateral bone, anterior and posterior brain. There is no apparent connection between the two. Could one be an individual brain while the other works as part of a collective consciousness? Branton. Some autopsies have revealed a crystalline network which is thought to have a function in telepathic and other functions which help to maintain the group consciousness between members of the same species. Functions of group consciousness in this species does have a disadvantage in that decisions in this species comes rather slowly as the matter at hand filters through the group awareness of those who must make the decision. The above description fits almost perfectly with the description of the UFO occupants witnessed by police officer slash patrolman Herb Shermer. Shermer described these creatures, which he swore he encountered outside of Ashland, Nebraska, shortly after midnight on December 3, 1967. They were from four and one half to five and one half feet tall. Their uniforms were silver gray, very shiny. Their suits came up around their heads like a pilot's cap. On the right side of their helmets they had a small antenna, just above where the ear would be. Their chests were bigger than ours, they were built very wary and muscular. Their eyes were the one thing I will never forget. The pupil went up and down like a slit. 
When they looked at me they stared straight into my eyes. They didn't blink. It was real uncomfortable. Their noses were flat, their mouths looked more like a slit than a regular mouth. The fact that the pupils of the creatures encountered by Shermer were slit-like would indicate that the creatures were most likely retinally and saurian in nature, as most snakes and lizards, etc., have vertical slit pupils. The retinalian connection which we make with the creatures encountered by Officer Shermer is not based solely on his testimony alone, but on the other testimonies of various persons who have also encountered creatures similar to the ones just described. Many of these accounts give a more definite link between the ancient reptilian saurian race which disappeared from the surface of this planet ages ago, and the non-human aphonauts encountered by literally tens of thousands of individuals the world over. Quest International C slash L15, Pictured Court. Templensum. Leeds, L559 AY. England UK, a major British UFO research organization consisting mainly of retired police, security and military personnel is presently investigating what may well be the most documentable case of the crash retrieval of an unidentified flying disc to date. On the 7th of May, 1989, Nurid installations allegedly tracked an unidentified object as it entered African airspace. The South African Air Force is also said to have tracked the craft by radar, traveling at a calculated speed of 5,746 nautical miles per hour. The incident was related by a South African intelligence worker who along with documentation of his military position, also sent secret files and transcripts to two Quest International investigators, Tony Dodd and Henry Arzadetl, telling of the event. Also, several recorded telephone conversations with high-ranking military and government officials were obtained which strongly suggest that something did in fact happen over South African terrain. Some of these recorded conversations involved military officials in South Africa who strongly reprimanded the intelligence worker turned informer over the phone. This was due to the fact that the informer had left South Africa for Britain, where he stayed at the house of the researchers, and then later went into hiding. Quest International Director Graham W. Birdsall has stated that the documentation and the individuals involved in the incident are of such a nature that the event must have taken place or the international intelligence community is collectively perpetrating a hoax of incredible magnitude concerning a crashed and recovered flying disc. Birdsall strongly suspects that the incidents did take place, due to the weight of evidence. Following is part of a word-for-word -word transcript given to the researchers by the informant, which he alleged was taken from the actual top-secret report of the initial tracking of the object. The object entered South African airspace at 13.52 Greenwich Mean Time. Radio contact was attempted with object, but all communications proved futile. As a result two armed Mirage fighters were scrambled. A short time later the object suddenly changed course at great speed which would have been impossible for conventional aircraft to duplicate. At 13.59 Greenwich Mean Time, squadron leader group of dashes, the pilot of the fighter reported that they had radar and visual confirmation of the object. The order was given to arm and fire the experimental aircraft mounted forward to a laser cannon. This was done. Squadron leader Group of Dashes reported that several blinding flashes emitted from the object which had started wavering whilst heading in a northerly direction. At 14.02 it was reported that the object was decreasing altitude at a rate of 3,000 feet per minute. Then at speed it dived at an angle of 25 degrees and impacted in desert terrain 80 miles north of the South African border with Botswana, identified as the Central Kalahari Desert. Squadron leader group of dashes was instructed to circle the area until a retrieval team arrived. A team of Air Force intelligence officers, together with medical and technical staff were promptly taken to the area of impact for investigation and retrieval. The findings were as follows, 1, a crater 150 meters in diameter and 12 meters in depth. 2, a silver-colored disc-shaped object 45 degrees embedded inside of crater. 3, around the object sand and rocks were fused together by the intense heat. 4, an intense magnetic and radioactive environment around the object resulted in electronic failure of Air Force equipment, causing the crash of one Air Force helicopter. 5. The object was eventually moved to an Air Force base for further investigation. 6. The terrain of impact was filled with sand and rubble to disguise all evidence of the event having taken place. The report indicated that a hydraulic type landing gear was fully deployed, suggesting that electronic malfunction had caused the object to crash, probably due to the Thor 2 laser cannon having been fired at the craft. While the team observed the object at the Air Force base a loud sound was heard. It was then noted that a hatch on the lower side of the craft had opened slightly and appeared to be stuck. 
This opening was later forced with the use of hydraulic pressure equipment, at which point two humanoid entities in tight-fitting gray suits emerged and were promptly apprehended. The report stated that the entities were of the following description, emphasis hours, Branton, height, 4-5.5 feet. Complexion, grayish-blue, skin texture smooth, extremely resilient. Hair, totally devoid of any bodily hair. Head, oversized in relation to human proportions. Raised cranium with dark blue markings around head. Face, prominent cheekbones. Eyes, large and slanted upwards towards side of face. No pupils seen. Nose, small consisting of two nostrils. Mouth, small slit devoid of lips. Jaw, small in relation to human proportions. Body slash arms, long and thin reaching just above knees. Hands, consisting of three digits, webbed, claw-like nails. Torso, chest and abdomen covered with scaly reeved skin. Hips, small narrow. Legs, short and thin. Genitals, no exterior sexual organs. Feet, consisting of three toes, no nails and webbed. Notes, due to aggressive nature of humanoids, no samples of blood or tissue could be taken. One humanoid attack doctor causing deep scratches on face and chest. When offered various food, refused to eat. One way passage has been requested for both humanoids to Wright Patterson Air Force Base USA for more advanced investigation and research. Many of the details regarding these humanoids are actually very similar to other branches of the reptilian race as it has been described by other witnesses. It appears as if the serpent race is composed of several different branches or types, much the same as dogs and other animals retain their distinction but are composed of several different types or branches. Commonly known reptiles are devoid of bodily hair, have prominent cheekbones, large slanted eyes, small openings in place of ears three-digit web hands and feet, except in the case of snakes, etc., which lost use of their limbs through atrophication over one thousands of years. Have claws, are covered with scaly, reaped skin, and have no external reproductive organs, being egg layers, and are aggressive and predatory in nature. The top secret document indicated that the passage of the object and creatures would be implemented on the 23rd of June, 1989 to Wright Patterson AFP. Actually, Sources do indicate that Wright Patterson DID in fact go on red alert on that day. Subsequent documents supplied by the intelligence source to Quest International indicate that the creatures seem to have a strong connection with the Saurian race which existed in ancient times. The exact wording of one particular document which is now in the hands of Quest International is as follows. All information found aboard alien spacecraft concerning the evolution of alien life forms indicates to an evolution similar to that which we find on Earth prior to the extinction of the dinosaurs. The findings indicate a high degree of adaptability. Further physiological and psychological studies performed in South Africa and in the United States points to a simple and complex structure of behavior. It would seem as if these life forms cannot function independently without group intelligence and identity together with a central command. According to additional information found aboard retrieved craft a separate race is designated superior by them. Conclusion, an in-depth study and analysis of the psychological makeup and behavior prediction is advised. Studies performed on two alien life forms captured has proven that they cannot act independently from own acquired intelligence without access to communication, orders and instructions from a hierarchy or central command. Three different aspects of the South African affair in fact coincide very closely with what other sources have revealed concerning these reptilian saurian or alien creatures. 1. Numerous sources indicate that the Sarioid greys are the lower echelon of a hidden reptilian hierarchy, and that the other race which is considered to be superior is saurian reptilian and hominoid as well, although they are a different and larger branch of the serpent race. They resemble lizard men of a somewhat similar appearance to the raptors depicted in the movie Jurassic Park, yet of a more hominoid mutation or appearance than those depicted in the movie. 2. Many other sources state that the serpent race, saurians or reptilians operate on a collective consciousness level as if the individual alien beings are, to put it in one perspective, individual cells in an immense mind or body of a single immense creature. Actually there seems to be a combination of both individuality as well as collective consciousness operating in these entities. 3. The description of the aliens as well as the electromagnetic nature of their craft corresponds exactly with descriptions given in thousands of separate reports of this nature. The intelligence officer who contacted Quest International and provided them with the information claims he did so out of concern for the security of the human race as a whole.
and although he was pressured into signing a National Secrecy Act form he believes that he would be guilty of treason against the human race if he did not disclose what he knew and what the governments were trying to hide. It is remarkable that the majority of the non-human occupants which are reported in connection with these aerial craft are said to be reptilian or saurian in nature, especially in light of such prophecies as the one given in Revelation chapter 12, which reads, And there was war in heaven, Michael fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent, called the devil, and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. One of the phenomena which we have mentioned earlier has taken place in several different parts of the world, but most prominently along the continental divide region of the, the United States since the late 1960s, bizarre animal, especially cattle, mutilations have been on the increase. Numerous accounts claim that these mutilations were performed with laser-fine surgical precision, with cuts so precise down to the separation of the molecules themselves that they could not have been accomplished by the conventionally known technology of the time. Eyes colons, reproductive organs, etc., are very often reported as having been removed in such a manner as if part of the rehearsed process being carried out in widely scattered locations. The blood is almost always described as having been drained with no resulting vascular collapse, also impossible with the conventional technology of our society at the time. In most cases no tracks or markings in the ground have been discovered, which is another mystery that investigators for a large part have been unable to explain. But in the few cases where markings have been seen, the investigators consistently report the existence of strange tripod or crop circle marks in the ground, nothing else. Another strange phenomena surrounding these mutilations is the fact that predatory birds and other animals which have fed off the carcasses of the mutilated animals have often been found lying dead nearby. It is even reported that in some cases maggots have refused to touch such carcasses. Again, the reason is unknown. Just who or what is mutilating these animals? The mutilation phenomena was at its height from the mid-1970s to the late 1980s. In the mid-1990s the mutilations seemed to have had a major resurgence, especially throughout the Rocky Mountain states. In the VOL.5, NO.4, 1990 issue of UFO magazine, PP.16-17, Linda Moulton Howe, in her article, The Harvest Continues. Animal Mutilation Update made some very remarkable observations concerning the mutilators themselves. She wrote, In 1989, there were so many cattle mutilations in southern Idaho that Bear Lake County Sheriff Brent Bunt told me, we haven't seen anything like this since the 1970s. Sheriff Bunt sent me 16 neatly typed investigation reports about cattle mutilations that had taken place in his county between May and December. Over half occurred in a remote valley called Nounen. Only 80 people live there. Ranching is their main income source, and cattle are precious. Disease and predators are old and well understood enemies. What descended on Nounan, Idaho in the summer and fall of 1989 was not understood, and it scared people. Bloodless cuts, that's what bothers people, Officer Greg Athey wrote in his mutilation report. There were no visible signs of the cause of death. It appeared that only the soft tissues, nose, lips and tongue were gone off the head and four nipples off the bag. Again there was no blood on the hair and ground. Howe described another incident which took place in this region during the same time period. This series of mutilations involved mostly cattle, over half of which were young calves. One mutilated calf, found December 24, 1989, north of Downey, Idaho, was found lying on its back with the navel, rectum and genitals neatly cut out of the steer's white belly. No blood was found anywhere. The steer was taken for an autopsy to Dr. Chris Oates, DVM, at the Hawthorne Animal Hospital. Dr. Oates checked all the vital organs and was unable to determine the cause of death. During the autopsy, a sharp cut was found in the right chest area, and Dr. Oates also discovered that the main artery had been severed onto the chest wound. She was surprised that the steer had lost a large amount of blood, but she could not understand where it went to. There was no blood on the steer or on the ground. Dr. Oates also determined that the steer had not been dragged by the neck or tied up around the feet. Linda Howe also confirmed the fact that strange aerial discs have often been reported in connection with the mutilations. Throughout the history of the animal mutilations, since 1967, there have been numerous eyewitness accounts of large, glowing discs or silent helicopters over pastures where dead animals were later found. One way go, Texas rancher said he encountered two four-foot-tall, light green colored creatures with large, black, slanted eyes, 
carrying a calf which was later found dead and mutilated. In 1983, a Missouri couple watched through binoculars as two small beings in tight-fitting silver suits worked on a cow in a nearby pasture. The alien heads were large and white in color. Nearby, a tall, green-skinned lizard man stood glaring with eyes slit by vertical pupils like a crocodile's. On October 20, 1991, California researcher Michael Lindemann, founder of the 2020 group 3463 State Street, Suite 264, Santa Barbara, California, 93105, gave a lecture before a large crowd of interested investigators which seems to confirm much of the information which appears above. Mr. Lindemann began his report by saying, How many of you saw the program on CBS Network on May 17, 1991, called Abduction? It was narrated by James Earl Jones. It was really quite a remarkable program, it took the subject of abduction absolutely seriously. This was Prime Time Network. CBS. Of course Fox Network has done a number of other programs and there have been some outstanding UFO segments on Unsolved Mysteries. But last night, maybe even a little more remarkable than the Fox One Hour special, was what came on the news right after. Because in the Fox Network news program that followed in the 10 o'clock segment there was a hard news story about the allegation that the United States government is doing business with Grace. I have never seen anything like it. It was a very impressive indication of the way in which this subject is suddenly becoming okay to talk about. That says to me there has been a switch at the top. In our conversation today I use two terms. And the first of these terms is, government. We speak of the government as if it is a single thing. It is hardly that. It is actually a hodgepodge of power struggling people, but I would like to break it up into two main categories, and that is, the government that we consider to be our duly constituted, our elected and appointed representatives who attempt as best they can to run a semblance of order or federal government which follows the dictates of the Constitution of the United States. The Constitution is, after all, a darn good piece of paper, it is one of the best ever written. If only our government were capable of behaving and even a resemblance of what is intended in the Constitution, probably few of us would have a great deal to gripe about. Now that they've failed to do that is not only because they are fallible humans, but also because they are undermined by another government. There is indeed another government operating and that government has immense power and operates primarily behind the scenes. And some other researchers have called it the secret government, some have called it the high cabal. And it is a group of people, a very elite group, non-elected, self-appointed people who guide the evolution of government policy from behind the scenes. These are people who transcend partisan politics, indeed who transcend the rule of law, and have no thought whatsoever toward the dictates of the Constitution. These are people who regard themselves as the only true guardians or crafters of geopolitical reality. And they regard us, indeed they regard elected officials as mere mortals. These people are the self-appointed Olympians. They have done many things in the name of an agenda which is their own, that we would consider appalling and reprehensible. Indeed things that are criminal, but they're more than criminal because they have sapped and usurped the rights and privileges and the possibilities of our future. These people are running a kind of end game right now. They are trying to determine how they will survive the end time. Whether that end time comes as a kind of biblical apocalypse or as the catastrophic collapse of the environment the so-called population bomb and all the other things. Whether it comes as a collapse of the banking system which looks to be only days away, or the collapse of the rest of the world's economy, there are many things that could get us. These people in effect are building their own version of Noah's Ark. And that Noah's Ark they are building is underground. Underground bases, indeed all over the world, but particularly here in the United States. Huge underground bases that have actually festooned the underground geography of our continent in a way that would probably stun and shock you. But they even have an underground government, because you see when the government top seed is no longer functional because a nuclear bomb lands on Capitol Hill, or whether it comes simply because the chaos has reached a point where they must abandon ship, there is preparation as there has been for decades for continuity of government. All the computers, all the personnel are currently in place and operating around the clock. Yes, they are their friends, we have another government in waiting, a government that you never authorized, that you never said we would pay for, that has cost a colossal fortune, but it's their underground, ready to take over. And indeed, here in our area, I have focused on the Lancaster, California area as an example of one of the many. But even in Lancaster in particular, we know for certain are huge underground bases. 
These are not only places where incredible research is underway but also places where people will go to live when the bleep hits the blades as they say. And, these are places that are capable of supporting on an ongoing basis some tens of thousands of people. And so across the country it may be possible to save an elect remnant of some hundreds of thousands of people who will be the cream of the civilization that is meant to survive the apocalypse or the downfall. Or whatever it is that's out there getting us. Us mere mortals will have to fend for themselves. The expectation is, part of the end game is, that those on the surface will eventually fight each other into a draw or will die of exhaustion or starvation or brutality. And that eventually the mere mortals will destroy themselves and rid the world of excess population, so that the cream, the remnant, will come forward and claim their rightful place. I must say that there is an immense amount of evidence which does support this exact scenario. Let's talk about the term aliens, because there are those who claim that there are aliens among us. There are at least three kinds of aliens represented in the evidence available to us. He explains these as those presently inhabiting other planetary bodies such as the greys. Those hidden among us such as human-like beings who inhabit underground, undersea and in some cases other planetary regions yet, who often walk unnoticed in our societies, and paraphysical entities who inhabit another dimension other than the one we see with our physical sight, Branton. And I think the evidence is very strong that there is a profound alien presence among us. These are people who are here, beings who are here, in large numbers. But there is this government that has known about the alien presence for a long time, a government that has been playing an end game. A government that has an agenda of concealment and control, that is operated by terror. In Lancaster, that agenda of concealment and control is what I call the Lancaster Syndrome. It produces strange distortions in many people's lives. First let me tell you about a man who sits today in Pierce County Jail outside of Tacoma, Washington. This man's name is Michael Reconaciuto. Lindemann states that Reconaciuto formerly worked for a corporation called Wacken Hut, which provides special security protection for high security areas such as the Nevada test site. Michael R. claims that the real reason he was sent to jail was because he swore out an affidavit against the Department of Justice. In that affidavit he explained that though the United States Department of Justice had swindled the private company in slow out of a proprietary software called Promise. This software was a database designed to track special groups of people according to various characteristics. It was a very powerful, very capable database. Inslaw developed this in the early 1980s and took it to the Department of Justice thinking it would be a good law enforcement software. The software would be most useful in helping to track terrorists and other troublemakers. Certain men within the Justice Department realized that if they could get control of the software, according to Michael R., they could sell it to other countries and make huge profits. So the Department of Justice allegedly made a deal with the Inslaw Corporation for an exclusive on the promised software and then they drove Inslaw into bankruptcy by refusing to pay. Lindemann continues, the amazing thing is that they were caught. And in 1988 Barron's magazine in the April 4, 1991, issue, contained this fairly astonishing piece of news, presiding judge in the bankruptcy hearing was Judge George Basing. According to Barron's, Judge Basing had found that the Justice Department had personally propelled Inslaw into bankruptcy in an effort to steal its promised software through trickery, deceit and fraud. On February 2, 1988, Basing ordered the Justice Department to pay Inslaw about $6.8 million, no doubt to be ultimately financed by the friendly American taxpayer, Branton. He postponed at that time a decision on punitive damages which could run as high as $25 million. And as it happens, all of that is all in appeal. The Justice Department was not at all pleased with that ruling. It does state that justice is in a sorry state in America. If you didn't know that already, I hope this helps you to understand. Michael was responsible for doing the modifications on the promise software before selling that software to the Canadian government after it was stolen from Inslaw, and so he had an inside track on this information, Lindemann stated. He explained that the Department of Justice, among other things, prevailed on them in FEB of this year, 1991, not to offer his information in the ongoing lawsuit. One Department of Justice official by the name of Peter Vodenix stated that if he would cooperate with this request they could promise him certain benefits, including an assurance of a favorable outcome in the prolonged custody battle between Michael R. and his ex-wife. According to Michael R., the Department of Justice also outlined specific punishments that I could expect to receive. 
if I did cooperate with the House Judiciary Committee? Now this is just an indicator, Lindemann states, that the Department of Justice definitely has its own idea of the meaning of justice. Michael Reconosciuto went ahead and swore out an affidavit against the Justice Department alleging grand larceny against the Inslaw Corporation. Lindemann stated that none of the threatened punishments ever came about as they found an easier way to frame him. That is, they busted, framed him for drugs, and now he sits facing a possible life sentence in the Pierce Company jail. But because of that he's very, very scared because he knows now that these guys will take him out whenever they darn well feel like it. And so he's talking. He's talking in every way he can. In particular we wanted to ask Michael R. something about some of the things going on at the underground bases. I'd like to read you just a little bit of what Michael Reconosciuto told us recently about that. I asked him, what did he know about the underground bases in the Lancaster area? I'm going to quote now our conversation, he said, well, there's extensive stuff inch. I call it the Edwards position, and then at Nellis over in Nevada, and at the Nevada test site. Then he went on to say, last summer I had a group of guys bagging a whole bunch of files and records, and some equipment out of Walken Hut, and they had a helicopter loaded to the nuts, and they got shot down before they could get out of there. I don't know how many of you noticed, Lindemann continues, but there was an article in the Los Angeles Times, the 24th of July of this year, fatal copter crash AT the nuclear test site probed. This was the most serious accident which had ever occurred in the history of the test site. Five people were killed when this helicopter went down, and the Fondado and the National Transportation and Safety Board all converged on the nuclear test site to figure out what brought this copter down. But you may be assured that they will never tell you because it was shot down by Walken Hut, and it contained two pilots and three Walken Hut personnel according to the article in the Louisiana Times. I said, I heard about that. Are you saying that that was a group of, let's say, Renegades from the inside who were trying to bolt for the blue and Wacken had shot them down? Is that your allegation? And he said, yep. And I said, is there anything more that you can say about this? He said, not on the phone. I said, were you aware of that before it happened? He said, single quote why yes. I told a handful of people that we were hoping to get a big stash of stuff out of there. I said, were they trying to get out of Nellis? He said, no, not Nellis, off the nuclear test site and the information they were trying to get out, what did it pertain to? And he said, guess. I don't even want to talk about it. The worst. And I said, the very worst, Hugh. And he said, yep. Now I don't know of the very worst, do you? I mean I'm not really sure, but it seemed to me, judging from other things that we had talked with Mike about and some of the other things that we've heard from witnesses in the underground bases, the very worst could be one of two main possibilities in my book. The very worst number one, really nasty, scary alien stuff. The very worst number two, really nasty, scary biotech. Bioengineering stuff. There's all kinds of genetic engineering, some of which has to do with the creation of biological warfare agents, some of which has to do with the creation of strange bacteria, and perhaps new strains of chimpanzees and perhaps people. There are very, very weird experiments going on, and I thought, oh, K. Fine, maybe one or the other of those things. But our conversation continued and it leaned in one direction, so let's just see what he had to say next. I said. One of your associates seemed to indicate that there was technology operating that would have the appearance of flying saucers, but be absolutely terrestrial. Can you comment on that? And he said, sir, we had some propulsion devices that were, let's say, rather astounding. I said, is this stuff operational? And he said oh. Yes, it's operational. I said, oh. K, so there are vehicles. Would you say that they belonged in the arsenal, or are they part of a sort of gee whiz lunatic fringe of science? And he said, oh no, they're part of the arsenal. It's not lunatic fringe stuff, it's all well funded, it's all very real. I've worked on portions of it, I've worked on teams that have worked on this stuff, and I've seen with my own eyes. The only thing that I have been shielded from, is any real alien contact that I've never been brought directly in contact with, in fact, that part has been minimized to me. And I said to him, in the way you've said that, I get the impression that you assume that there are extraterrestrials, that is, aliens, around. And he said, I have no direct knowledge of that, okay? That's all. There's a lot of strange technology, there's a lot of extra heavy security, okay? 
Anybody who breaches a certain point of security is instantly dead or disappears. I said, are you saying that given all the other indiscretions you've shown over the years, that this one would be worst? And he said, single quote why yes, I would say so. I said, really? He said, single quote why yes, yes. It's like those people who were leaving the nuclear test site, they were summarily blown out of the sky. Now, Michael knew he was talking on a prison telephone, his phone was tapped indeed, that people who talk too loud, in too much detail about the actual alien situation are liable to run into severe problems. Being that he's already in prison in a sitting duck, he's obviously very careful with his words. But we have talked with some other people who have been more forthright about what they have actually seen in the underground bases. One of our sources is a construction worker. He came out of Vietnam, he was a very decorated special forces soldier. Among other things he got the Congressional Medal of Honor. And because he was special forces in the Vietnamese War, when he came back stateside he was offered all kinds of bizarre jobs in top security. He felt that those would be too restrictive so he went into construction instead. But because of his military record he had an inside track on a security clearance. He wound up doing construction in the underground bases. Now you see, the underground installations are built just like a building is built. You know, you've got to do electrical conduit, you've got to paint the walls. Who's going to do it? It's not going to be the Secretary of Defense. It's going to be a guy like our guy. It's going to be like this fella who's got a Congressional Medal of Honor and now does special electrical conducting underground. So he's told us what he saw. There's a facility called Haystack Butte, it's on the Edwards Aft Reservation. Note, at this point Lindemann shows the audience a map of the area encompassing Edwards Aft, the city of Lancaster and Palmdale to the south, which is the site of 532 where the B-2 bomber is assembled, along with a lot of other secret aircraft. All of the major aircraft and aerospace companies are located in this area, among other sites. It also showed the Tehikapi facility west of Lancaster, nicknamed the Ind Hill, which is administered by Northrop and which is rumored by some to house underground disc hangars for wingless aircraft built by the secret government military industrial establishment. In the southeast corner of Lindemann's map the Techuan Ranch was visible, which is a large cattle ranch that goes up into the area of the Tehikapi Range to the southeast of Bakersfield, California. He also pointed out an extensive underground facility maintained by McDonnell Douglas and the Hellendale facility administered by Lockheed. In this same general area is Haystack Butte, which is jointly administered, with North American Rockwell involved as well, Branton. So what we have here is a situation where you've got our major aerospace companies heavily implicated. I mean this is what is meant by the military-industrial complex. These companies are heavily implicated in super, super-secret projects, and at the very top they're all cooperating together. All the bidding wars and everything that you see are like mid-level smoke and mirrors. But at the very top we were talking about projects that are conducted by all these different people pooling their resources, pooling their information, and indeed pooling their money, which comes in incredible profusion from the black budget. How many of you have seen the book Blank Check? It is not a UFO book. I strongly recommend that you read the book Blank Check so that you can understand something about how these projects are funded without your say-so indeed without the say-so of Congress. Most citizens don't know for example that the National Security Act of 1947 made it illegal to ever say how much money is spent on the CIA. Indeed all of our tremendous alphabet soup collection of intelligence agencies. Whether you're talking about the CIA, or the NRO, or the NSA or the DIA, etc., all of them are in the same category. You cannot say how much these things cost. All you can do if you want to find out is add up the numbers on the budget, which at this writing is at a deficit of well over four trillion dollars, a large portion of which may have been spent on construction for the underground nation, Branton, that aren't assigned to anything that actually means anything. There are these huge categories that have tens of billions of dollars in them that say nothing but special projects. And every year the Congress dutifully passes this bloated budget that has some three hundred billion dollars or more with huge chunks of cash labeled like that. Special projects. Unusual stuff. Ten billion dollars. Okay, well where does the unusual stuff money go? Well, it does go to unusual stuff, that's for sure, and one of the places it goes is into the underground bases. Indeed Tim said recently since the publication of his book, Blank Check. More black budget money goes into underground bases than any other kind of work. Now I don't believe that 35 billion 
which is the approximate size of the black budget money that you can find by analyzing the budget, I don't think that comes close to the real figure because there is absolutely unequivocal evidence that a great deal of additional money was generated in other ways, such as the surreptitious running of guns and drugs. And one wonderful example of that is coming to light with the BCCI scandal, which I hope you've heard of. A number of very high-ranking American officials are caught in the underdo of the Chi tidal wave. Even though these guys are tying to pull fast ones on an immense scale they are getting caught. These things don't always work. Indeed they are very, very vulnerable. Indeed this whole end game is very vulnerable and that's why they feel it requires such secrecy. The American people wouldn't stand for this stuff if they had the information, and that's the reason why we have to get the information out and take it seriously because it really is a matter of our money and our future that's being mortgaged here. But my friend who worked in the underground bases, who was doing sheetrock was down on, he thinks, approximately the 30th level underground. These bases are perhaps 30-35 stories deep ground scrapers as opposed to a ski scrapers, Branton. As I say they are not just mine shafts. These are huge, giant facilities. Many city blocks in circumference, able to house tens of thousands of people. One of them, the Yano facility, we were told. By the county fire department director, the county fire department chief who had to go in there to look at a minor fire infraction. There's a 400 car parking lot on the first level of the Yano facility, but cars never come in and out. Those are the cars that they use inside. Okay, so. A very interesting situation down there. Our guy was doing sheetrock on the 30th floor, maybe the 30th floor, underground. He and his crew are working on a wall, and right over here is an elevator door. The elevator door opens and, a kind of reflex action you look, and he saw three guys. Two of them, human engineers that he'd seen before. And between them a guy that stood about 8 to 8 and 1 half feet tall. Green skin, reptilian features, extra long arms, wearing a lab coat, holding a clipboard. I tend to believe that story because, first of all because we have other stories like it, but more importantly because he walked off the job that very day. And he was getting paid a great deal of money. If you're basically a sheetrock kind of guy, if you can do sheetrock in a place like that then you get paid way more than standard sheetrock wages, you can count on it. So, he walked off that job. His buddy on that same crew turned into an alcoholic shortly after. This is an extremely upsetting thing. You know. It wasn't like this alien jumped out and bit his head off or anything. It was just standing there for a few minutes. The door is closed. He has a feeling that that elevator was malfunctioning. Otherwise he never would have seen that except by accident. In another incident though. At the China Lake Naval Weapons Station. Up here at China Lake. Near Ridge Quest. They were working there on the China Lake Naval Weapons Station and walked by a hangar. They walked by a hangar as they were headed for their trucks to leave for the day. And they had parked their trucks in an unusual place, a place they didn't normally park, because it was an extremely hot day and they wanted to keep the trucks out of the sun. So the security had given them permission to park the trucks in a place that wasn't normal. So they walked by a hangar that they didn't normally walk by, and they looked in, just kind of glanced in, and saw inside a couple of greys working on something. And of course they were, you know, astonished. And an MP came running over and said, hey, you can't be here. What are you doing here? And they said, well, security said we could park our trucks here. And the security guard says, well that's fine, but you get out of here because you'll get yourself killed. So they left. But one of the young guys on that crew couldn't leave well enough alone. The guy we've been talking to said, look, I know what you saw, I know what I saw. I know what we saw at Haystock, but it's all for real. I know what's going on, but don't be a stupid jerk. Leave it alone. This kid didn't leave it alone, and very shortly thereafter he was booted off the base, and three months later he was dead under mysterious circumstances. Now of course we can't say that he died because of this. There's a disturbing pattern of people dying however when they see things they were not supposed to. Michael Reconosciuto makes it very clear in his statement to us that if you go past a certain point you're dead or disappear, just like that. We've heard that time and time again. Indeed there are a great many people on the inside who are making it clear that they would love to flee. People like these people that apparently were blown out of the sky, the walking hot garbage. These are trained mercenaries who have seen things they cannot stand, things that turn their stomach, things that make them want to grab evidence and flee for their lives. And they were blown out of the sky, 
probably by something equivalent to a Stinger missile or something like that. And there are lots of people who want to get out. Just an example of the way these people talk, one of them said to us, I would trade my $100,000 a year salary for a job at McDonald's if I could get out alive. There's a certain despair there, a certain feeling of entrapment. You see there are the people who know what's going on and who have created this agenda and have bought into it entirely, they are enrolled in it, and they believe that they are indeed the Olympians. They have to employ lots of normal humans like us to do the sheet rocking, to do the group work, and those people are in a very bizarre catch-22, because they are given the promise of a salary that they never believed possible. You know. They are going to paint walls all day, and they are going to take down a hundred grand a year, this is unusual. That's the upside of the deal. The downside of the deal is, you know, and they make it very clear. All these people who get these high security clearances are subjected to incredibly intimidating indoctrination and intimidation processes. They really do subject these people to tremendous pressure, tremendous intimidation. Indeed they do inflict great violence on people on whom they need to. They make examples of people. In one sense then, there's a growing division taking place between the constitutionalists of America and the alien-controlled segments within the underground bases. This would also include their human bonds who will apparently do anything, even murder their fellow human beings, in order to continue receiving the technological benefits from their alien masters, to whom they have sold themselves and whose agenda of control and subversion they are serving, whether knowing or unknowingly. The following is a transcript of parts of a speech presented by Norio F. Hayakawa, director of the Civilian Intelligence Network, at the 11th Los Angeles Whole Life Expo held at the Los Angeles Airport Hilton Convention Center on November 16 and 17, 1991. The transcript from which we will quote is a revised and expanded version of the address written on June of 1992 and is titled, UFOs, The Grand Deception and the Coming New World Order. Area 51 is located in the northeastern corner of a vast, desolate stretch of land known as the Nevada Test Site, a large portion of which includes the Nellis Air Force Test Range, but has practically nothing to do with underground nuclear testing. It is located approximately 125 miles north-northwest of Las Vegas and consists of Groom Lake and the Papoose Lake complexes. The presently expanding eastern portion of the latter complexes is known as the S-4 Site. This entire area is under the strictest control of airspace R-4808N with unlimited ceiling, prohibiting any entry therein of air traffic, civilian or military, unless special clearance for such entry is secured well in advance. By land, the area is meticulously patrolled 24 hours a day by several tiers of external security even through it is conveniently covered by the jumbled hills north of the Papoose Lake area making it virtually impossible for anyone to see the facilities without first climbing atop the hills of the rugged mountain range which became off-limits to the public since 1985. The main external perimeter security is now being handled by Wackenhut Special Securities Division, part of the operations of Wackenhut Corporation, a worldwide semi-private security firm based in Coral Gables, Florida which has an exclusive contract with the, the United States Department of Energy and handles not only the perimeter security at the Nevada test site but also at many other secret facilities and sensitive installations throughout the, the United States and the United States interests worldwide, including ground level perimeters for several large underground facilities in and around Edwards Air Force Base in Southern California. It is also important to mention that dozens of unmanned, miniature-sized remote-controlled automatic security vehicles constantly patrol the immediate perimeters of the S-4 site, located around and presently expanding particularly towards the eastern portion of Papoose Lake. These automatic, miniature-sized four-wheel vehicles have been produced by Sandia Laboratories of Albuquerque, New Mexico exclusively for the Department of Energy. The outer northeastern perimeters of this area located in the Ticabu Valley come under the geographical jurisdiction of Lincoln County and are relegated to the Bureau of Land Management BLM. Yet it is considered highly inadvisable for anyone to even enter the main country dirt road, known as the Groom Road, which begins its southwestern extension towards Groom Lake from a point midway between mile marker 34 and 33 on Highway 375, and leads to the guard shack located two and a half miles northeast of the Groom Lake complexes. The first line of exterior security forces, dressed in military-type camouflage uniforms, but with no insignia of any kind whatsoever, consists of the GP patrols, the groom proper patrols, 
in Bronco type four-wheel drive vehicles who sometimes drive around at night with their lights off on various country dirt roads adjacent to the outer demilitarized zone, intimidating any civilian vehicle that tries to enter those access roads off of Highway 375, located on public land. The GP patrols themselves, part of Wakanot Special Securities Division, however, are strictly ordered to avoid any direct contact with civilians. They are only instructed to radio the Lincoln County Sheriff immediately should anyone be spotted driving on any of those dirt roads. The most common radio frequency used between Security Control and Lincoln County Sheriff's patrols is 138.306 MHZ. The only area allowed by the Sheriff for such curiosity seekers to congregate is an open area near a black mailbox located at the south side of Highway 375 between mile marker 29 and 30. Even then, the Sheriff Patrol will routinely stop by during the evening to check on the cars parked at the mailbox area. Moreover, it is our understanding, based on information provided by a highly reliable source connected to a special the United States Navy SEAL Operations Center, that the mailbox area is constantly being monitored by high-powered, state-of-the-art, infrared telescopes set up at a facility known as Security Control High atop Bald Mountain, 10 miles west of the area, the highest peak in the Groom Mountain Range. It was precisely at 4.45 a.m. on the morning of Thursday, April 16, 1992, that an NBC News crew, dispatched to the area to report on the landing of an alleged super spy plane known as Aurora on Groom Lake, accidentally succeeded in videotaping the first flight which we have been calling the Old Faithful of a mysterious object while standing at the mailbox area and looking due south toward Jumbled Hills. The footage, taken with a night scope vision camera, was broadcast nationally on NBC Nightly News with Tom Brokaw on April 20, 1992. The NBC News reported that it had videotaped a test flight of a new the United States aerial craft that had definitely defied the laws of physics, and that the news team may thus have taken the first glimpse of the other deep black projects aside from the Aurora project being conducted within the confines of the top secret facility. Also in regards to the ongoing program, it is to be noted that usually a day or two prior to significant test flights, that is, only if the test flight is a significant one, by whatever measure known only to the installation, a vehicle traffic counter is laid on Highway 93, at approximately a mile and a half north of Ash Springs, right before the juncture of Highway 375. The other counter is set up about a half mile or so west upon entering Highway 375. The obvious question is, in such desolate, less traveled areas of Nevada, why should there be such traffic counters installed on undivided, lonely highways? It is now my belief that the number of cars being registered that head out west on Highway 375 at such times, particularly in clusters, such as caravans, is related to several of the security posts at Area 51, including the main observation post high atop the previously mentioned Bald Mountain. However, it is very possible that they may now have more sophisticated devices for registering the number of vehicles going through the area. The February 21, 1990 expedition was instrumental in the subsequent production of a two-hour documentary program entitled Saturday Super Special televised throughout Japan on March 24, 1990 which was seen by more than 28 million viewers on prime time. The entire program dealt with Area 51 and also the crew's pursuit of an alleged biogenetics laboratory thought to be located just outside of Dulce, a tiny town in northwestern New Mexico, about 95 miles northwest of Los Alamos. The The United States Naval Research Laboratory seems to have a perhaps psychology research unit that coordinates its research activities with DARPA, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency. It is my understanding that some of their activities conducted under the auspices of the Office of Naval Intelligence are being held at locations such as Area 51. ALF, extremely low frequency, wave emitting devices, scalar machines, electromagnetic beam weapons, and highly defined hologramic projections are just a few examples of the many new types of mind control weaponry that the government seems to have developed in the past three decades or so. Newest researches on special types of hallucinatory and memory tampering drugs are part of a growing arsenal that the, the United States Naval Intelligence boasts to have developed in its own perhaps psychology mind control unit. According to recent information provided to me by a highly reliable informant within a special operations group of the Department of the Navy, two of the most widely used devices will be RHIC, Radio Hypnotic Intracerebral Control, and EDOM, Electronic Dissolution of Memory. The first of the two, Radio Hypnotic Intracerebral Control, 
calls for the implantation of a very small, electronic, micro-radio receiver. It acts as a stimulator which will stimulate a muscle or electronic brain response. This, in turn, can set off a hypnoprogrammed cue in the victim or subject, which would elicit a preconditioned behavior. The second one, electronic dissolution of memory, calls for remotely controlled production within the brain of acetylcholine which blocks transmission of nerve impulses in the brain which results in a sort of selective amnesia. According to this source, in the hands of certain units within the intelligence community both of these methods are already beginning to be used. An amazing article appeared in the Los Angeles Times on May 12, 1992 announcing that Caltech scientists have recently discovered and confirmed the presence of tiny magnetic particles in the brains of humans, similar to those that have heretofore been found in other animals. Louisiana Times, Section, Page 3. According to the Caltech researchers, it is now an undeniable fact that every human brain contains a tiny natural magnetite particle, even from the time of conception. Could the government, particularly though the United States Naval Research Laboratory, have known this fact for a long time? The answer definitely seems to be in the affirmative. Note, perhaps the Philadelphia experiment, described in Charles Berlitt's book of the same name, had an adverse effect on the electrochemical or magnetite particles in the brains of the experimental subjects. Could this explain why so many of them allegedly went insane after the tests? Branton. It is interesting also to note that as of this writing, many strange, turquoise colored antenna towers, with triangular configurations on top, are beginning to be constructed along key areas near the freeway systems of many of the United States cities, particularly proliferating the Los Angeles and Orange County areas of California. According to several reports, these antenna towers are presently being used as relay towers for the increasing networks of cellular telephone systems being operated by such firms as Pacific Bill and Telesis. Yet the most interesting aspect of the constructions of these strange antenna towers is that there are increasing reports that the Department of Defense is somehow involved in this operation. The frequency waves being utilized in the cellular telephone communications are, according to several researchers, strikingly close to the range of frequency waves used in several health emission and microwave experiments of the United States Naval Research Laboratory as well as DARPA, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency. Note, non-digital cellular telephone conversations can be easily intercepted. This writer has succeeded in listening in on cellular conversations by scanning through the upper frequencies of the off-band on a normal television set. So then, along with the mind control capabilities, it is evident that cellular phone conversations have also been heavily monitored by military intelligence, Branton. Will these towers be utilized throughout the nation? A large underground genetics laboratory is thought to be located just outside of Dulce, a tiny town in the midst of the Jicarilla Apache Indian Reservation located about 95 miles northwest of Los Alamos and 100 miles east of Sinister Sounding Highway 666 the only stretch of highway in the, the United States with that designation and the only highway that links the four states of Arizona, New Mexico, Colorado and Utah. Perhaps it may just be a pure coincidence that this highway, befittingly named Highway 666, which originated in southeast Arizona and goes up north, cuts into northwestern New Mexico, right near the Four Corners area, an area that happens to have one of the most consistently concentrated UFO sighting reports in the country since around 1947. This entire Four Corners area, especially northwestern New Mexico and southwestern Colorado also has had some of the most concentrated reports of unexplained cattle mutilations in the nation during the late 70s and early 80s. Was something covertly taking place in those areas? Even though we could not locate the alleged underground genetics laboratory in Dulce when the Nippon television crew and I visited the area in late February of 1990, I had several opportunities to interview scores of local residents there that admitted that nightly appearances of mysterious lights occasionally accompanied by unmarked black helicopters, darting over, into and out of nearby Arculeta Mesa and Arculeta Mountains, were quite common during the late 70s and early 80s. Many of them even claimed to have spotted on many occasions, military-type trucks and jeeps as well as government vans passing through Dulce and loitering around nearby mesas. Occasionally even black limousines carrying what appeared to be CIA agent types were claimed to have been sighted loitering around the foothills of other nearby mesas. We must bear in mind that the Dulce area is only 95 miles northwest of Los Alamos. Los Alamos National Laboratory is one of the top the United States research laboratories specializing in the study of the human genome. 
Also it is a vital center of the government's deer research and development programs. Just about a hundred miles southeast of Los Alamos is Albuquerque, New Mexico's largest city, and more significantly, a city where Kirtland Air Force Base is located right next to the sensitive Manzano Storage Facility, a top-secret underground military facility. Sandia Corporation, one of the nation's top-secret government contractors specializing in top military industrial projects is also located in Albuquerque. As far as advanced biotechnology is concerned, I have no doubt that a microchip implantation technology is being perfected in which tiny microchips could be implanted in our circulatory systems, vital organs and tissues if need be for whatever purpose the future may require. It is my conclusion that a large-scale research has been completed by the government with possible assistance from outside sources within the last 20 years or so utilizing tens of thousands of cattle in the southwest to conduct this covert experiment. Only recently has science proven that cow hemoglobin could be substituted by utilizing a special purification system with human blood in situations of unforeseen national emergencies. Researcher David L. Dobbs of Cincinnati, O. described the following resume of report received. After the Muffin 40 meter net on April 5, 1980, Mike deleted, Iowa deleted, stated that during the period 1961 to 63 he performed radio maintenance at the Atomic Proving Ground. He also did some top secret radio work for the Air Force at times. The U-2 was developed here. Area 51 single quote was located 60 miles due east of the base camp, behind a mountain range separating it from Yucca Flat. Here a secret operation was performed under unbelievable security precautions known as Project Red Light. A UFO which had been shipped from Edwards AF was flown here. It was not conventionally powered, but was silent in operation. Mike assumed that this was the disc recovered intact and shown in the UFO movie reported by radar technicians. Security in Project Red Light was so strict that no one stayed there more than six months. Mike did not see this movie himself, however. While on vacation, he saw a story in Reader's Digest at his parents' home which told of a UFO exploding over the test site in 1962 while being flown. This would have been a recent story at the time. Mike is aware of the conventionally powered disc built by the Air Force which was publicized. We both feel that this may have been a cover-up for the real project which he describes. He also heard the stories about parts from a UFO which could not be duplicated successfully by aerospace contractors on the West Coast and many of the rumors about UFOs which have emanated from Nellis Afb. Incidentally, Nellis Afb operated Area 51 single quote where he says the UFO was flown. This information has bothered him for 20 years, and he wonders if it might be possible for documentation regarding Project Red Light to be obtained under the Freedom of Information Act. According to various sources, Area 51 single quote in Nevada, where he has for Groom Lake, or Dreamland complexes are located, is the same area where the stealth bomber, Senior 71, Star Wars or SD technology, and all manner of aerospace high-tech had been developed and tested. These include CIA experiments and tests. Other names for the Dreamland complex include the Ranch or the Skunk Works. This is where Francis Gary Powers, who flew the ill-fated U-2 spy plane mission which was shot down over Russia where Powers was held prisoner for some time, was trained. Incidentally, there are also rumors that the vast caverns which have been excavated by the underground nuclear blasts in the adjacent Nevada nuclear test range have been and are being connected by underground tunnels and used for top secret purposes. If this is the case one may wonder how the problems of radiation residue were solved. Via clean nuclear blasts. Referring to the subsurface regions, we quote now from yet another item that appeared in the NAR newsletter, which was titled, Is Inner Earth Research Hazardous to Your Health? An observation has recently been made that most of the outstanding inner earth researchers have died of heart attack. Note, heart attack is reportedly one weapon or method of psychic attack that is recognized by those occultists who are familiar with voodoo or psychic warfare. Heart attacks of this nature are allegedly induced by the use of intense terror that is projected against individuals by the initiators of such attack. It is alleged that hominoid non-human beings such as the serpent races might have the ability to direct psychic attacks against human beings via the use of black magic, witchcraft or sorcery. It is interesting that there have been very few if any ufologists, etc., who claim to have taken up a devout Christian lifestyle, who have physically suffered the negative side of UFO research, including encounters with MIBs, abductions, paralysis, heart attacks or other fear-oriented forms of victimization.
This suggests that a deep faith in the Creator may neutralize the fear that the aliens seem to depend on as their major weapon in their psychic attacks against humankind, making the believers impervious to their otherwise destructive influences, Branton. Surely, this is beyond a simple coincidence. Gray Barker, Dick Shaver, and Joan O'Connell, New Atlantean Journal, are but a few, also, researcher Charles Maku, Branton. Locally, there are several inner-earth researchers who are very notable and their persistence. Lou Turi, who has recently relocated to Utah, was the foremost local proponent of the geomagnetic vortex-slash-UFO connection theory. Lou was instrumental in the discovery of underground tunnel networks in the Las Vegas area, one of them being between the base of Boulder Dam and Jumbo Peak, where there are two mines whose owners view 200 single-quote diameter disks on a frequent basis. At one point, Lou offered to set up an interview with these miners. Alas, Mr. Turi is not to be found. A local Henderson resident, who shall remain nameless, has been into inner earth research for years. This person has been hounded and chased due to intimate knowledge of inner earth tunnels in the local area. There is obviously something here that some people wish to protect. Something to hide. Many seem to know what it is, and they speak cautiously about reptilian humanoids and the serpent race which are two subjects which seem to be surfacing again. Response to local television and radio programs featuring John Lear have been overwhelming. A recent lecture in Las Vegas drew over 700 people. According to some sources, the Greys are the lower level of a bigger scenario that involves this reptilian race. The following is a transcript of a letter which was sent by John Lear to researcher Tal Levesque. The letter, dated October 6, 1990, states, Dear Tal, Many thanks for your recent very interesting letter. I showed it to Bob, that is Lazar, Branton, and he thinks we are both crazy. He does not believe that Dulcie exists. Bob went through extreme brainwashing at S4 so I can understand his feelings. About the time that he was brainwashed, maybe a little before, he told me that Dulcie was mentioned up there once or twice in conversations that he was not part of. But that he overhead. Since that time he has forgotten even that part. Since I know Dulcie exists, what Bob thinks does not affect me in the least. A source of mine that is a security guard at the test site tells me that currently there are five types of aliens there, the greys, the orange, the reptilians, the ones that look like the aliens in the movie V, and the ones that look so ugly that they take your breath away until you get used to looking at them. I now believe that a very large saucer crashed near Sedona, possibly two years ago and is in the process of being retrieved in sections, as it is too big to remove in one piece. The recent stories in Aviation Week, I believe, are attempts to buy more time, to mislead the public and to confuse the issue. Note, Lear is here referring to the article in the October 1, 1990 issue of Aviation Week and Space Technology, titled, Secret Advanced Vehicles Demonstrate Technologies for Future Military Use. The article referred only to the fairly well-known super-advanced jets being tested in Nevada, giving the impression that these may explain all of the UFO sightings in the area. Branton, again, I appreciate very much your fascinating letter and look forward to more information on Dulcie. With much respect and admiration, John Lear. In connection with the subject of this file, that is the invasion of an alien race from above and below utilizing mind-bending techniques, psychological warfare, mind control and implantation, we will quote from Brad Steiger's The UFO Abductors, 1988. Berkeley Books. New York. In 1969 I and my research associates, Loring G. Williams and Glenn McWan, were bombarded with the claims of dozens of contactees who said that they had had an implant left somewhere in their skulls, usually just behind the left ear. These contactees slash abductees came from a wide variety of occupations, cultural backgrounds, and age groups. We employed private detectives and medical doctors. In an attempt to learn what archetype had been fed into their particular group consciousness, we never found any implants that were detectable to x-rays, but our hypnotic sessions turned up an incredible amount of fascinating, albeit bizarre, information about underground UFO bases, hybrid aliens walking among us, and thousands of humans slowly turning into automatons because of readjusted brainwave patterns. Dagmar and Carl are of the farm in northeast Iowa about 40 miles from the Mississippi River. One night in August of 1982, Carl observed what he called at the time a lantern in the sky that hovered over him while he was working late in the field. In October that year, while Carl was working late in the field preparing for the annual corn harvest, he was startled to see the glowing lantern return to the sky above him. 
It appeared to be the same object that he had seen in August. Although he tried to remain oblivious to the object, it seemed to be hovering above him, even following him up and down the corn rows. He became nervous and disconcerted and went back to the farmhouse, where he asked Dagmar to come out and witness the strange object. Dagmar was able to see the object, too, and they stood and watched it for several minutes before it suddenly moved high into the night sky and then sped off at a great rate of speed in a westerly direction. About three the next morning, Carl was awakened by the sound of cattle bellowing nervously in the stockyard. As he got out of bed and looked out the bedroom window, he saw a disc-shaped object hovering above the barnyard. It was glowing in a kind of greenish color. Following this, the couple was tranquilized by the object or its occupants somehow, possibly by some kind of intoxicating, pacifying or stimulating ray which apparently induced a drug or trance-like electrochemical reaction in their brains and bodies, after which they were taken by some entities. A conventional abduction sequence ensued, similar to that described by so many thousands of others. Steiger related the couple's afterthoughts concerning their abduction by smallish, large-eyed beings with only nostril openings rather than a pronounced nose and with tight, expressionless lips. Steiger continues, while the young Iowa couple can remember no further UFO interaction since that particular autumn, they both admit to being nervous about having another encounter. Carl, especially, feels that he was used. Dagmar speculated that bits of her skin tissue might have been removed in the examination. And although she does not claim to be an expert in such matters, she wonders if enough of her body could be cloned in a way to interact with whatever embryo or fetus might have been fathered by the semen that was taken from her husband. Note, Dagmar claimed that during one part of the examination, a needle-like object was stuck into her abdomen. Many believe that this is one process by which the entities extract of them from human females, Branton. Not wanting to sound like victims of some science fiction thriller, the young couple have theorized that they might have been used in some strange program of creating hybrid beings. Perhaps, they suggest, Carl Seaman was used to impregnate an alien female or an Earth female, who is somehow influenced by and under the control of alien beings. In either event, they are uncomfortable with the experience and with the memory of the encounter. Both of them feel as though they may have been used in ways opposed to their normal expression of will. Dagmar has gone even farther in her speculations by suggesting that if bits of her body could have been used to create a clone, and if Carl Seaman could somehow be used at a future time to impregnate such a clone, then alien beings could be breeding their own brand of humans as part of an organized program to create an army of human-like robots that would be totally under control of aliens and their master plan to conquer Earth. UFO investigator Richard Siffride was told by Pam Owens that she was taken aboard a UFO on November 25, 1978, while she was expecting a child. She was 19 at the time, and she had no memory of the abduction until she was hypnotically regressed. Then she was able to give full and fascinating details of her encounter. Mrs. Owens told Siffride that she was paralyzed and able to move only her eyes. She lay helpless on a table and stared up in terror at two weird-looking creatures. According to Mrs. Owens, their heads were hairless, oversized domes, their eyes were big and sunk back in their skulls. The greenish skin covering their bodies was coarse. Each hand had four fingers that she described as being twice as long as a human's. And to her terror, one of those strange hands was holding a long silver needle, preparing to plunge it into her stomach. Dr. Clifford Wilson, M.A., B.D., Ph.D., in his book, UFOs, and their mission impossible, Signet Books. New York presents his own intelligence or research concerning the ongoing invasion slash infiltration of our society by alien powers. Not only have many seen UFOs, but there is also a growing army of those who claim to have had actual contact with UFO occupants. An authoritative, and possibly conservative, estimate is that there are 50,000 silent contactees in the United States alone. It could well be there are thousands of people who do have information and are not prepared to reveal it because of threatened consequences to themselves. Possibly many do not know they have that knowledge because they themselves gained it in a hypnotic state. Hypnotized slaves await a signal, nations could be conquered by the infiltration of agents into government seats of authority, and it is surely more frightening to think that mankind could be overcome and even destroyed by programmed men and women from within their own ranks. If there is indeed a final confrontation approaching, an army of people could be involved. They could be ready to take action which they themselves do not even anticipate, but yet with no option but to obey because they have been conditioned to obey, at a given signal. 
We are not alone in suggesting this dreadful possibility. To quote John Keel once again, we have no way of knowing how many human beings throughout the world have been processed in this manner, since they would have absolutely no memory of undergoing the experience, and so we have no way of determining who among us has strange and sinister programs lying dormant in the dark corners of his mind. Suppose a plan is to process millions of people and then at some future day trigger all of those minds at one time. Would we suddenly have a world of saints? Or would we have a world of armed maniacs shooting at one another from bell towers? If Armageddon, to which the Bible points, is indeed a final battle in which human and non-human forces alike wage that dreadful conflict to the death, this sort of programming is a real possibility, and it appears to be proceeding at breakneck speed across the whole of the world. It is reported that the term Armageddon has been used in a message to a contactee and other end of the world messages have been given. Is there a desperate preparation for a last ditch stand by the forces of evil, a final attempt to thwart the plans of the holy God against whom they have rebelled? Bible history gives many examples where satanic forces have attempted completely to destroy God's plans that would result in total blessings for man. There has continually been a diabolical scheme to bending minds by deceitful assurances and brainwashing post-hypnotic suggestions, with inbuilt commands for action to be triggered at a given signal, would fit the general pattern of rebellion consistently seen in the Bible records. A frightening prospect, the prospect if frightening. It is entirely possible that by post-hypnotic suggestion a whole army of people could suddenly find themselves willing slaves of intelligent beings who care nothing for the welfare of those slaves, or of the world itself as we know it. If there is some great super plan of a spiritual counterattack to reach its culmination in Armageddon, it could well be that this army of slaves will be available to obey orders, without even knowing beforehand that they have been inducted into the armed forces of what the Bible refers to as the principalities and powers. The indications are that even children are at times utilized for the implementation of the plans of these evil powers. That possibility is illustrated by the following incident. On December 12, 1967, Mrs. Rita Malley was driving along a public highway to her home at Ithaca, New York, with her five-year-old son Dana in a back seat of her vehicle. At about 7 p.m. she suddenly realized that a red light was apparently following her, and as she was moving above the speed level, her first reaction was that she was about to be pulled over. She looked through her window and found that it was not a police car behind her but an eerie flying object, moving along above the power lines at the left of her car. Then she found she no longer had control of her vehicle, and shouted to her son to brace himself. However, he remained motionless as though he were in a trance. A white beam of light flashed down from the vehicle overhead, then she heard voices that sounded weird, broken, and jerky. She herself became hysterical, but through it all her son took no notice whatever of her cries. The radio was not on, but she heard those voices tell her that at that moment a friend of hers had been involved in a terrible accident some miles away. The next day she found that this was indeed true. The voices also told her that her son would not remember anything that had happened. The ordeal was terrifying to Mrs. Malley herself, and for some time afterward whenever she remembered the episode she would break down sobbing. It would seem possible, then, that pliable children are especially useful for the purposes of these beings. Many children have been used as tools so that men and women would believe in these beings who have a plan whose totality has not yet been revealed. These incidents are not limited to children. Mrs. Ralph Butler was watching flashing lights outside a Waytona in Minnesota one night in November, 1966. She was with a friend, and suddenly her friend became immobile, with her head dipped down. Mrs. Butler herself heard a voice talking to her, but soon the ordeal was over. However, when the two friends tried to discuss the incident later, both found they immediately suffered blinding headaches. Mrs. Butler also told of hearing strange voices on her radio, and of having peculiar visits from Air Force officers. This pattern is reported by many who claim to have been contacted by UFO personnel. The Butler family have experienced various poltergeist phenomena since that 1966 experience, glass objects moving around and breaking without any known cause, strange noises being heard throughout the house, even telephones and television sets being strangely interfered with. Note. Such activity often occurs during UFO encounters where there seems to be a collective involvement of paraphysical poltergeists or infernals, reptilians, and possibly controlled cybernetic men in black, such activity as is typical of the malevolent powers that have allegedly established bases or empires in systems such as Alpha Draconis, Epsilon Boots, Altair Aquila, Zeta Reticuli, 
Bellatrix Orion, and Rigel Orion as well as their Solarian Subterran counterparts, Branton. This sort of activity has followed many other supposed saucer sightings. The similarities between the stories are of such a nature as to cause surprise at first, someone temporarily in a trance, men posing as Air Force or other officials, those men being slight in stature with dark olive skins and pointed features, and the contactees having dreadful headaches, hallucinations, and nightmares. Some of them have gone into trances and have temporarily become mediums through whom strange voices could be heard. A takeover attempt. Is there to be an attempt at a takeover? There surely are limitations to the life-giving powers of these UFO creatures. Man is the master of the animals, and despite seemingly way out theories, such as monster insects waiting to attack us, in fact man is still able to control the lesser creatures. Evil forces are real, even apart from my strong Christian beliefs, and my acceptance of the Bible as the revealed word of God, I would have no doubt whatever as to the fact of spiritual beings, evil forces, and phenomena that cannot be explained by purely physical psychical, or psychological concepts. If there is truth in this hypothesis, preparations would be going on, just in case these overheard futurist interpretations happen to be correct. On July 30, 1992, radio announcer and reporter for Radio Free America, Anthony J. Helder, sent the following letter to Patty Cathereta, Lincoln County District Attorney, Pioche, Nevada 89,043, 702-962-5171. Several dozen copies were sent by Helder to other researchers as well as several activists, political, legal, media, patriot, congressional, and real national defense officials. Dear Mrs. Cathereta, I am calling on the Attorney General of the State of Nevada to initiate an immediate full-scale grand jury investigation into the activities of the Wakanhut SS, your office in the Lincoln County Sheriff's Department. The reason for the urgency of this action is because of the rapidly increasing number of life-threatening situations created by unidentified paramilitary personnel who operate under the color of law to harass, intimidate and suppress the constitutional rights of many hundreds of American citizens and Japanese nationals who come to view the unidentified flying saucer-shaped discs being tested over your county. It is my prayer that with the prodding of the people in the press that the Attorney General will launch this investigation in time to avert one of these innocent individuals from being murdered by that paramilitary mob or winding up as a permanent prisoner in one of the strange underground experimental laboratories below Dreamland and S4 within the Nellis test range. During my conversation with you on the afternoon of June 6th, I made repeated attempts to acquire the names of six individuals who were arrested last month by the Lincoln County Sheriff's Department somewhere in the Tikabu Valley. As a reporter, I sought your professional cooperation. I did not get it. Not only did you refuse to reveal the names of those arrested and their alleged violation of law, you continually badgered me for my home address, phone number and specifically just what radio stations would be broadcasting the story. Could it be that you wanted to cover up the story? As I stated, I simply wanted to cover the event. I am curious as to the reason you would attempt to prevent the media from reporting the arrest. Obviously you didn't want me to contact those people for their side of the story before their arraignment. Is there something you fear from honest disclosure? What is it that you don't want to know? Could it be that these arrests were illegal? Did the Sheriff's Department violate the constitutional rights of these citizens, Mrs. Catherita? Has it become the policy of Lincoln County Sheriff's Department with your approval and under the color of law, to harass and intimidate the curious onlookers who come to your county to sit beneath the stars in the high desert, hoping to see and possibly photograph the strange and alien lights in the night sky for which that region has now become famous? Is this a crime in Nevada? One might wonder if Lincoln has now become the first county in a Hitlerian superstate of a new world order, where freedoms are suppressed and terror tactics are public policy? It's definitely not a top secret that what's going on within the bowels of those underground bunkers at S4 and Area 51 in the Nellis test site is above top secret. Obviously there's something very strange going on out there that the Black Project boys have to hide regardless of what it costs. If the public were to become aware of what these Dr. Strangelove's single quote were creating in those underground laboratories, I believe the world would be shocked and horrified beyond all belief. Need I remind you that it is your responsibility as District Attorney of Lincoln County to uncover, not cover up crimes that are being committed in your county. Other questions arise. Is there a dereliction of duty by the District Attorney's office? Do you have a conflict of interest? And for whom do you serve? 
I am deeply concerned as is the American Civil Liberties Union in seeing that the constitutional rights of all Americans who live in or pay a visit to Lincoln County are protected, not violated by the Waukenhut SS Security Service, your Sheriff's Department, or anyone else. Correct me if I am wrong, but at one time or another did you not take some sort of oath to uphold and defend the Constitution of the United States? Or is the Lincoln County District Attorney exempt from upholding such antiquated trivialities as the United States Constitution? Would you be willing to share with me information as to how and why the Wakenhut SS is allowed by your office under the color of law to stop, intimidate and harass sightseers on public land? Are they above the law? Are they immune to prosecution? What law is it that allows the Wakenhut SS to drive unlicensed vehicles on county roads in the state of Nevada at speeds far exceeding the posted limit? Does your office now allow them to search sightseers' vehicles without warrants? Maybe some judge in Lincoln County issued them pocket warrants? And if so, what judge has the legal authority in this country to issue such invisible warrants to the Wakenhut SS or any other paramilitary mob? What law gives you the legal authority to allow the Wakenhut SS to stop, interrogate and intimidate sightseers, tourists, campers and naturalists? Or for that matter, do they need to ask your permission at all? Are they a law unto themselves? Are these Hitlerian harassers CIA, NSA, Black Project, UN or paramilitary personnel? Just where is the law in Lincoln County? Asleep? Or do you simply wink your eye at all those Orwellian incidents? The obvious collusion between Wagenhut and the Sheriff's Department necessitates that these questions be asked. It has become even more necessary to prevent our freedoms from disintegrating, that these questions be answered. Who are these men who stand behind loaded fully automatic weapons, show no identification, wear camouflaged clothing, display no badges, wear no emblems, drive unlicensed vehicles, and who show no warrants when they stop and interrogate American citizens on American soil? They demand to see identification, social security cards, driver's licenses, take pictures of the sightseers, record their conversations, Search their cars and write down the license plate numbers for her files just like in Nazi Germany. They have even on occasion drawn their weapons and aimed them at American citizens, with what can only be described as intent to kill, should the sightseers not instantly obey their commands. Surely you must be aware that all this is taking place on public taxpayer-owned land in your county. Why are you allowing this, Mrs. Cathereda? Who are these paramilitary people that you seemingly protect from prosecution? Under whose authority do these neo-fascist forces operate? Yours? MJ-12. Some cryptic banking cartel. The Skull and Bones? The Jason Society? Global 2000 Report? The Trilates? I know it's not the Boy Scouts, Mrs. Gathereda. Just who is running the show? I doubt seriously that the average citizen of Lincoln County who pays your salary has any idea what's going on. I feel quite certain that the residents of Rachel Pioche and Alamo haven't secretly met with you in some obscure smoke-filled back room to persuade you to make sure that the Walkenhut SS remains immune from criminal prosecution. I don't quite understand why you're doing what you're doing or rather not doing. Does somebody have some sort of hold on you? Does some secret society pay for your cooperation? Or are you in the Sheriff's Department just working with the Walkenhut SS voluntarily, without pay? In Nazi Germany, Hitler had a quasi-government group called the SS beyond their borders, they called the collaborators Waffen SS they were authorized by the Fuhrer to operate beyond the law. Is this the case in Lincoln County? Has the Walkenhut SS replaced the Waffen SS? Under what law have you allowed unmarked black helicopters to buzz, harass and threaten the lives of tourists in Lincoln County? If these aircraft are not, by the law, allowed to threaten the lives of people who come to Tikabu Valley to see the sights. Then why hasn't your office prosecuted these criminals? Are they above the law? Or has selective prosecution replaced criminal justice in Lincoln County? Are you ready to testify in a court of law that you are unaware that black helicopters have been swooping down upon innocent travelers in an attempt to scare them or try to kill them? If you don't recollect any such incident, let me remind you but one. Norio Hayakawa, Gary Schultz and a party of sightseers were buzzed by an unmarked helicopter in a life-threatening manner in May of 1991. Under what law do you allow such outrage to occur over Lincoln County roads? Have you bothered to even so much as discuss this attack with those who authorized it? Why haven't they been brought to court to explain their offensive action taken against those innocent, unarmed people? Did you make no attempt whatsoever to prosecute the perpetrators of that crime? 
Might I remind you that it occurred over a Lincoln County road, which is under your jurisdiction? On March 26th of this year Norio Hayakawa and Shinichiro Nomiki were stopped by Under Sheriff Gary Davis and Deputy Sheriff Doug Lamoureux, at which time their camera equipment was forcibly confiscated on public land by these two armed men. In years gone by this was considered highway robbery. Under what law do you justify such outrage now? Or is theft now legal in Lincoln County? Is it not incumbent upon you to at the very least bring Lamoureux and Davis up before a judicial hearing in front of an unbiased judge? In case you've lost their numbers, Mrs. Catherita, you can reach under Sheriff Davis at 702-725-3447 and Deputy Sheriff Lamoureux at 702-725-3645 in their off hours when they might be more inclined to give some straightforward answers about this outrageous behavior. I realize that you are at the very least angered by my inquiries. If your arrogant attitudes towards this reporter is any example of how you slip, slide, duck and hide from inquiries by others in the fifth estate, you must hold those of us in the media with very deep disdain. Your attitude reminds me of Richard Nixon. He had a similar attitude towards the free press, but you are in good company, so did Adolf Hitler. This country has been very good to me, Mrs. Catherita. I owe a great debt to our forefathers who had the courage to stand up and speak out against tyranny imposed upon them by King George. They had to fight for the freedom we enjoy in this greatest nation on earth. So I am not about to remain silent, turn my back and do nothing as you would prefer me to do while I see our constitutional rights that they fought and died for twisted and turned by the knaves of Lincoln County law enforcement. I realize that you're paid handsomely to do and say what you do, Mrs. Gatherada. I have no problem with you making money, just as long as you don't sell out our freedoms to obtain your fortune. Our freedoms are not for sale and we are not willing to see you surrender them to some neo-fascist new world order. I fear that if your belligerent behavior is allowed to remain unchallenged in Lincoln County, Nevada may well be on its way to becoming Nazi-ized. I thank God that we still have freedom of speech and expression in this country. In the Kimu Nazi nations of this world I would be investigated and subject to arrest for daring to make such inquiries of even a tank town backwards bureaucrat. Up until recently in the Soviet Slav system the KGB would concoct evidence against individuals like Solzhenitsyn who dared to bring to light the grisly Hitlerian horrors happening in the Gulag archipelago. As deeply as you might be in covering for those who are covering up the nightmares of Nellis, I believe that you will soon discover that the overwhelming majority of those who receive this letter are far more dedicated to uncovering crimes being committed against American citizens in your neck of the world than you will be in prosecuting crimes committed in Lincoln County. Incidentally, irrespective of how new you might think that President Bush's New World Order is, his presidential proclamation is definitely not new. Adolf Hitler used the exact same words to describe his plan for global government some 50 years ago. Now Bush claims he wants to accomplish it in a kinder and gentler way. But that's just on TV, for the mindless masses. For your edification the New World Order is the title of Hitler's second book. The first one was Mein Kampf. It served the Fuhrer and his fascist followers who justified the inhuman wrongs of human rights committed throughout Europe. This included justification for Dr. Joseph Mengele's monstrous medial experiments that were performed on the unsuspecting population in order to develop a master race. Of course there's a difference between Bush and Hitler's phraseology. Hitler talked about a thousand year Reich. Bush talks about a thousand points of light. I know that it shatters your senses for someone like myself to suggest that genetic engineering and medical experiments could be going on in the miles of tunneled underground facilities at S4 and Groom Lake, and that history could be repeating itself, yet this topic has come up repeatedly over the past year, from several sources. I recall one case in point when the Lincoln County Sheriff's Department picked up a young black woman named Tracy Wingfield who was wandering about in the Tikabu Valley one night near the perimeter of the base. As I understand it she's in the Navy and is stationed out of Hawaii. She claimed to have been abducted and brought to the facility twice for medical experiments. Did your office investigate her charges? And if not, why not? According to the FBI and Department of Justice records, well over 300,000 children end up missing and unaccounted for in this country every year. Where do you think these milk carton kids disappear to, Mrs. Catherita? Certainly they can't all get swallowed up in the inner cities or wind up in shallow graves off lonely backwoods roads or served up on the table of some psychopathic cannibal. In Bill Hamilton's book Cosmic Top Secret there may be an answer to this question. 
In it is described a literal Hitlerian hell on the earth which was created at a top secret black project base called Dulce. That one is located in New Mexico, not far from the Los Alamos National Laboratory. I have enclosed two pages from Hamilton's book for your review. Though I suspect you will, I pray that you don't, take these murderous matters lightly. I have recently heard stories of people who, under hypnosis, have described in nightmarish terms what goes on in these godforsaken underground facilities like Dreamland. Based upon what I have heard, I can only describe the hull holes as Frankenstein factories. According to my sources, these laboratories are run by a small army of IGORS, the invisible government Strabatons, who follow the party line as did their Nazi predecessors who ran the Hitlerian hospitals at Auschwitz and Dachau. I don't know what Hitlerian horrors are happening out there with Project Red Light, but I feel it's imperative to ask the Attorney General of the State of Nevada to appoint a special, independent, non-government investigative team to uncover just what kind of experimentation is going on in the underground facilities at S4 and Groom Lake. If these biogenetic experiments are taking place in United States territory, should not they be subject to the same federal regulations that all of the other medical institutions are subject to? Branton. The country has the right to know if the missing milk carton kids are being used for genetic engineering and if adult abductees are used for mutation experiments and body parts. I would think that if you refuse to cooperate with such an investigative team or to even address this issue, one might conclude that you, like your predecessors, are following close to the party line. A final question about the final solution, Mrs. Gathereta. As you know, Adolf Hitler was reported to have ordered his IGORS to gas millions of innocents in death camps like Auschwitz and Dachau to cleanse the world of the Jewish problem. Did you ever ask yourself what happened to those atomic scientists in Germany who were developing the Abom and the dozens of doctors who conducted those medical experiments on human beings? Is it merely coincidental that there exists many thousands of Malthusian-minded men who openly accept mass murder as necessary to bring about a new world order? These Orwellian one-worlders working within the Bush Black Project believe that the world's population has to be reduced by 1,25000. 000,000 people by the year 2000, 25 percent. If you don't believe, they're a madman with this mindset. Read Global 2000 Report's master plan. These Malthusian men have the minds of monsters. They use controlled conflicts, war, bacteriological warfare, AIDS, sterilization, mandatory abortion, and weather modification to create droughts that result in mass starvation. To achieve their end objective for global government upon the ashes of all national sovereignty they are willing to mass murder millions. That requires, of course, the cooperation of officials like you, Mrs. Gathereta, to follow the party line. I know it's very hard for you to accept, even in your wildest thoughts, that an American Auschwitz could exist under American soil. I bet it's even harder for you to conceive that it could be fully functioning in Lincoln County. Are you willing to testify in a court of law that it doesn't exist there, Mrs. Catherita? During the Third Reich even the party liners who lived around the death camps were reluctant to believe that their government could commit such horrendous crimes as were discovered after the invasion of Germany. Yet, although they heard faint screams in the far distance and cries for help, they shut their ears to IT. Even though they saw carloads of people by the thousands going into the concentration camps, and none return, they shut their eyes to IT. Even when they saw billows of smoke belch from the bowels of the burners and smelled the stiff strong stench of burning flesh, they shut their senses to IT. And, in spite of the fact rumor had it that unspeakable horrors were going on in the killing camps, they shut their minds to IT. Those that asked local government officials, like yourself, what was going on were told that it was all top secret and involved national security. And not to question authority. Then one day when the war came to a close and the truth was unearthed, the party people acted shocked when it became public that millions had been mass murdered. They just couldn't believe that genocide, infanticide and homicide could have been not only allowed but carried out to the last deadly detail by other party liners and the government who just went along. Saw nothing, said nothing and did nothing. When it came time for the trial at Nuremberg, Mrs. Gathereta, the von, Vured, Varikers who ran the killer concentration camps at Auschwitz and Dachau, claimed innocence. Even those party people who shoved and shoveled their victims into those carnivorous crematoriums, claimed innocence. They said they were just obeying orders. They said they were merely carrying out the master plan, for the master race. I am not accusing you of any crime, Mrs. Gathereta. 
It is possible that you could just be so inordinately apathetic or just so blindly obeying orders that you cannot see or simply refuse to open your eyes to what's going on. Or do you claim innocence, Mrs. Catherita? The Attorney General's office will be the judge of that. It is the AG's responsibility to determine if any crimes have been or are now being committed or allowed to be committed by your office. Ultimately, any decision with regards to the wholesale abuse of the law is made by the prosecution who tries the case, be it in a court of law or before the bar of public opinion. Sincerely, Anthony J. Hilder. Radio Free America. Perhaps those of us who read these words should heed the battle cry of the Jews when they say, never again. In the early 1990s an avowed high-level intelligence worker in the, the United States government who refers to himself only as Commander X, for his own protection, spilled the beans on a key secret concerning the interaction and conflict taking place below the Mojave Desert, against the Grey Empire which had entrenched itself in the subterranean levels of the Southwest, the underground. Base outside of Dulce, New Mexico, is perhaps the one most frequently referred to. Its existence is most widely known including several UFO abductees who have apparently been taken there for examination and then either managed to escape or were freed just in the nick of time by friendly forces. According to UFO conspiracy buff and ex-naval intelligence officer Milton William Cooper, a confrontation broke out between the human scientists and the aliens at the Dulce underground lab. The aliens took many of our scientists hostage. Delta forces were sent in to free them but they were no match for the alien weapons. 66 people were killed during this action. As a result we withdrew from all joint projects for at least two years. Centuries ago, surface people, some say the Illuminati, entered into a pact with an alien nation hidden within the Earth. Commander X alleges. Though the United States government, in 1933, agreed to trade animals in exchange for high technology, and to allow them to use undisturbed underground bases. In the Western USA a special group was formed to deal with the alien beings. In the 1940s alien life forms ALF began shifting their focus of operations from Central and South America to the USA. The continental divide is vital to these entities. Part of this is to do with magnetics, substrata rock and high energy states plasma. This area has a very high concentration of lightning activity. Underground waterways and cavern systems. Fields of atmospheric ions etc. The following is taken from an article by Tal Lovesque, titled The Covert Return of an Alien Species of Reptilian Heritage, the Dulce Base, which appeared in a mailer newsletter distributed by researcher Patrick O'Connell, according to Tal, ages ago. A conflict with other beings, ALS, destroyed most of their reptilian civilization, which forced some into deep caverns and others to leave Earth to Alpha Draconis and Garaltair in the constellation Aquila which in ancient lore was associated with evil reptilian creatures. The conflict is a species war between the Avadamic seed and the serpent, Draconian seed. Note, researcher Maurice Dariel claims that this conflict took place between giant humans or elves working with pre-Nordics based in the Gobi region of Asia several thousand years ago, and reptilian hominoids based in Antarctica. Branton, under cover of darkness, with bases hidden inside the Earth. This nocturnal invader has chosen to reclaim what was once theirs and use it and us as a staging area in their ancient conflict with the elves. Note, that is, the reptilians wish to reclaim that which they want the United States to believe was once theirs. The elves are the so named elder race, a human like culture tied into the Avadamic heritage yet who have attained or retained a very tall physical stature, in some cases being twice as tall as the average international or surface Terran. Because of their physical differences, they have chosen to inhabit exterran, subterran, and according to some other dimensional realms so as not to induce irrational fear or worship of themselves by their more diminutive human cousins, Branton, humans with alien brain implants, the zombies, have been programmed to help overthrow mankind in the near future. The reptoids are even able to transform themselves into beings with human characteristics and features. The planet Earth is being stressed so that human resistance will be minimal during the overt takeover and control of mankind. It started as a joint interaction program. An alien species wanted to share parts of its advanced technology with certain humans and key positions of power within government, military, corporations, secret societies, etc. The population as a whole began to be manipulated into the alien agenda. They wanted total control of us. Note, when this was written, 
the real name of the source of information described in the following paragraph was withheld and known only as T.C. or Thomas C. We have now been authorized to reveal the full name of the former Dulcie base worker as being Thomas Edwin Costello, who possessed a level 7 ultra security clearance within the Dulcie facility, and who was in fact the head of security within the underground installation. There are unconfirmed reports that Thomas Costello, after years in hiding, has finally passed away in Costa Rica. Whether or not his alleged death had anything to do with his intimate knowledge of the underground bases, is not known, Branton. T. C. had seen tall reptilian humanoids at the base. This is interesting to me because in 1979 I came face to face with the over six foot tall other species reptoids which materialized in our home. They took blood from my wife, who is an RH negative blood type, and her daughter, who was 1500 miles away. We all came to know that the visitors were here to stay. We also learned how the reptilian race was returning to Earth and the Grays, who were mercenaries, were being used to interface with and manipulate humans. Their demonic agenda was to keep Earth's surface mankind confused and unaware of their true nature and potential. Also, to conceal the knowledge of vast and varied civilizations living within the Earth. The fantastic truth was made to seem a fantasy, a legend, a myth, and illusion. The reptoids are returning to Earth to use it as a staging area, in their ancient conflict with the Elohim. Note, the Creator and the angelic forces as described in Revelation chapter 12, who are not to be confused with the elves with whom the reptilians are also in conflict, Branton. The Adamic race has underground bases within Mars. They are a warrior cult culture. There is a vast network of tube shuttle connections under the, the United States, which extends into a global system of tunnels and subsidies. Note, they, reptilians, do not consider themselves aliens. They claim Terra, third from the sun, was their home before we, humans, arrived. Note, the Saurian greys may have originated on Earth and developed, or, mutated, from the early bipedal Saurioid species, yet there is much evidence that their claim that this is their planet is merely propaganda designed to convince the human race that they are we must surrender this world to their control, Branton. As a species, Tarl continues, the reptilian heritage beings, the greys, reptoids, winged draco with two horns, the classic stereotype of the devil, are highly analytical and technologically oriented. They are seriously into the sciences of automation, computers, and bioengineering, genetics. However, their exploits in these areas has led to reckless experimentation, with total disregard for ethics, moral standards, and empathy. This is also true of many of the human beings working with them. Tal then describes something which might seem unbelievable if it weren't for the fact that dozens of other sources tend to confirm it. This discovery was allegedly one of the real reasons for the incitation of the Dulce Wars. Level number 7 is the worst. Row after row of 1000s of humans in human mixture remains in cold storage. Here too are embryos of humanoids in various stages of development. Also, many human children remains in storage vats. Who are, were, these people? The sources for these incredibly disturbing allegations aside from Thomas Costello himself, according to Tal, included. People who worked in the labs, abductees taken to the base, people who assisted in the construction, intelligence personnel, NSA, CIA, etc., and UFO and Earth researchers. This information, Tal states, is meant for those who are seriously interested in the Dulce base. For your own protection, be advised to us caution while investigating this complex. The symbol for the Dulce base that is worn on many of the workers there, allegedly consists of an upside-down triangle or pyramid with an upside-down T superimposed over it. William Hamilton added a few comments in his book Cosmic Top Secret concerning studies of the carcasses of mutilated cattle found near Dulce, New Mexico. These include Schoenfeld Clinical Laboratories in Albuquerque analyzed the samples of the affected hides of cattle studied by Gomez and Burgess and found significant deposits of potassium and magnesium. The potassium content was 70 times above normal. Level 1 of the Dulce base contains the garage for street maintenance. Level 2 contains the garage for trains, shuttles, tunnel barring machines or what former Dulce base worker Thomas Costello refers to as the Terror Drive, Branton, and Disc Maintenance. The Greys and Reptoid Species have had ancient conflicts with the Nordic humans from outer space societies and may be staging here for a future conflict. Penny Harper, in the January 1990 issue of Whole Life Times, 
wrote an article in which she referred to the ufologist and prominent physicist Paul Benuitz. Paul Benuitz, whereabouts unknown. Note, a search of a major laser disc the United States telephone database in 1993 revealed only one listing for Paul Benuitz, at 120 E Pebble Beach Doctor, Tempe, Arizona, 85282, telephone number 602-966-5704. This may or may not be the Paul Benuitz in question, Branton. Paul was a scientist investigating an abduction case. A woman and her son drove down a road in the southwest. The woman witnessed aliens mutilating a calf. The aliens captured both mother and son, taking them into an underground installation. The woman saw many frightening things, apparently much of it similar to what abductees Krista Tilton, Judy Doherty and others had witnessed. Yet they, mother and son, also saw, according to Penny Harper, human body parts floating in a vat of amber liquid. After a horrifying ordeal, the woman and her son were taken back to their car. Benuitz was able to determine that there is a secret alien base beneath Dulce, New Mexico. He wrote the Dulce report and sent it to the civilian UFO group called APRO, that is Aerial Phenomena Research Organization. Benuitz was then committed to the New Mexico State Hospital for the Mentally Ill, where he was given electroshock therapy. When he was discharged, he publicly stated that he would not have anything to do with UFOs. He is a recluse today, but still alive, last I heard. Again, we quote from Commander X, who has stated, From my own intelligence work within the military, I can say with all certainty that one of the main reasons the public has been kept in total darkness about the reality of UFOs and aliens, is that the truth of the matter actually exists too close to home to do anything about. How could a spokesman for the Pentagon dare admit that five or ten thousand feet underground exists an entire world that is foreign to a belief structure we have had for centuries? How could, for example, our fastest bomber be any challenge to those aerial invaders when we can only guess about the routes they take to the surface? A loading radar as they fly so low, headed back to their underground lair? The Greys, or the Ebbs, have established a fortress spreading out to other parts of the United States via means of a vast underground tunnel system that has virtually existed before recorded history. The following account, concerning an area in the Mojave just east of Bishop Owens Valley, California, was related by Val Valerian in his Leading Edge newsletter, December 1989, January 1990 issue. The article, titled, Deep Springs, California, stated, Deep Springs, California is an area that is becoming known as the site for very strange events. According to the information released both on the air and Vegem and from other sources, the area is full of strange people wandering around in black suits. There have also been rumors that there is an underground facility in the area. Checking with gravity anomaly maps proved that there are large cavities under the ground in that area. The wildest claims relative to the area have stated that alien life airforms are being released there. Deep Springs Lake has been probed and it appears bottomless. Diverse have traveled along an underground river 27 miles toward the Las Vegas area before having to turn around. Note, this river would probably have been a partially water-filled passage with a large stream or river flowing through it, rather than an entirely underwater system, since 27 miles of travel through entirely underwater passage would most likely be entirely out of the question, with present diving technology, Branton. The following list of entity types or aliens comes from the anonymous intelligence worker Commander X single quote, as he received them from John Lear and other inside sources, three types of ebbs, grays, gray one, three and one half feet tall, large head, large slanted eyes, worship technology, don't give a damn about mankind, gray two, same type, different finger arrangement, slightly different face, more sophisticated than gray one. May not need secretions. Large nosed or large muzzled grays? Branton. Gray 3, same basic type. Lips thinner. More subservient to other two grays. Blondes, Swedes, Nordics, known by any of these monikers. Similar to humans, although it is unknown as to whether they are related to any of the nationalities mentioned. Blonde hair, blue eyes. Will not break, so called, universal law of non interference to help us. Interdimensional entity that can assume various shapes. Also include fallen angelics or poltergeists. These often apparently utilize androidal forms to operate in the physical realm, temporary energy forms, forms constructed from restructured physical matter, or even physical biological shells constructed from mutilated organs and other materials, etc. Branton. 
Harry dwarfs, 4 feet tall, 35 pounds extremely strong. Harry, possibly a degenerate branch of the humanoid Sasquatch, Branton. Very tall race, look like humans but 7 or 8 feet tall. United with blondes. Humans appearing similar to blondes seen with greys. Childlike mentality. Mibs, men in black. Wear all black. Sunglasses. Very pale skin. Do not conform to normal accepted patterns. Extremely sensitive to light. Researcher Val Valerian has quoted various inside sources who claim that the greys are able to use organs taken from mutilated victims to construct physical shells for their invisible or non-physical demoniacal poltergeist. Masters, allowing them to operate in the physical. In apparent confirmation, Commander X single quote shows how the Saurians might be able to create such biogenetic forms. What the government didn't realize was that they, the Greys, plan to abduct tens of thousands of individuals, plant monitoring devices in their brains, and program them with specific series of responses to direct commands. The Ebs, also behind our backs, began to mutilate cows and other animals because they wished to use their tissues to create a genetically advanced race of flesh and blood robots. When the government realized what the Ebs had in mind, and wanted to back out of their agreement, the aliens took over several underground bases where they had already installed underground laboratories. On p. 109 of John Keel's book The Muthman Prophecies, we read the following concerning an even more alarming possibility in regards to the reptilian threat. I am an amateur herpetologist and once kept three fanged cobras in my New York apartment. Until my concerned neighbors squealed to the Board of Health. Some of the descriptions of the alien entities impressed me as resembling some kind of reptile rather than human mammals. I didn't mention the reptile notion to anyone. But on July 24th, Leah, an alleged alien tied in with the men in black, Branton visited Jane, a contactee, and refused to talk about anything but eggs. She took some eggs from Jane's refrigerator and sucked out the contents like a reptile. Jane was perplexed by this exhibition and called me soon afterward. And on pages 176-177 of Signet's 1975 paperback edition of Muffman Prophecies, in reference to the same contactee, Keel states, Meanwhile, Jane's phantom friends were visiting her daily and helpfully giving her surprising information about my own secret investigations. My interview with the Christiansons of Cape May, and the details of their pill-popping visitor, Tiny, was then known only to a few trusted people like Ivan Sanderson. But on June 12, Mr. Uphall and his friends, including the creature referred to above which called itself Leah, Branton visited Jane when she was alone in her house and asked for water so they could take some pills. Then they presented her with three of the same pills, told her to take one at that moment, and to take one other in two days. The third pill, they said, was for her to analyze to assure herself it was harmless. They undoubtedly knew she would turn it over to me. Two hours after she took the first pill she came down with a blinding headache, her eyes became bloodshot, and her vision in her right eye was affected. When her parents came home they expressed concern because her eyes were glassy and her right eye seemed to have a cast. The sample pill proved to be a sulfa drug normally prescribed for infections of the urinary tract. The possible significance of the sulfa drugs will become apparent later on in this file. In early 1992 the Universal Company's debut network aired a made-for-TV version of John Carpenter's movie They Live, which was based on the premise of an alien race of bulge-eyed, one might imagine Saurian reptilian, creatures that had infiltrated human society, disguised as humans, and which were in the process of subtly taking control of powerful social, media, economic and political positions. They were assisted by a small group of human power elite who through subliminal mind control, hidden frequency transmitters, television propaganda, etc., helped to keep the masses in a constant state of semi-consciousness. Those who had not caught on to the alien conspiracy went about their business in a slightly catatonic state sufficient to keep them blind or asleep to the point that the aliens and their subversive activities remained just outside of their conscious perception. It is interesting that John Carpenter, not to be confused with the well-known Muffin investigator, depicted the attempts of the aliens to annihilate human consciousness as a means to minimizing human resistance, by destroying individual creativity and programming all human cattle to conform to the dictates of the alien intruders. All of this without humanity even being aware that they were the mind slaves of an alien force which they were programmed to believe did not exist. Also in the movie, 
Secret subliminal messages were broadcast throughout all levels of society via all branches of the media, keeping the sleeping masses in a constant state of tranquilized apathy and subservience. A horrifying prospect to say the least. Also in the movie, the aliens utilized joint underground bases beneath major cities which were more or less the backstage of the alien control scenario. Incidentally, Disney World in Florida contains an underground tunnel network with hidden entrances. The employees of the park use these as a backstage, dressing rooms, employee indoctrination centers and other facilities necessary to keep up the illusion of Disney World. This is of course all innocent enough, yet John Carpenter in his movie reveals the idea that the huge underground bases beneath major cities are being used as backstages in order to keep an infinitely more diabolical illusion going, with the help of power elite who are assisting in the covert subjugation of the masses for personal gain. The movie They Live was based on the short story by Ray Nelson, 8 o'clock in the morning. One might wonder where Nelson got the inspiration for his story, especially when we realize that the subject of the story and the movie itself is very similar to events which, according to numerous sources, are actually taking place, if we are to accept the many accounts which appear in this and other files. Also, in the movie it is the Judeo-Christian element which first wakes up to what is going on and who begin the revolutionary resistance movement in order to destroy the stranglehold of the aliens upon human society. Could this scenario be somewhat prophetical as the book of Matthew 1324-28 seems to suggest? Note, there have been similar reports as the above emerging from the Dougway test site on the salt flats of western Utah, just across the border from the Nevada military complex. In fact there are allegations that much of the joint alien Illuminati activity which originated within the Nevada military complex has now moved into the underground facilities which even are being constructed beneath Utah and Idaho, now that the Nevada activity has been the subject of wide exposure by the media. There is one reported case where a worker at the Dougway test site claimed to have seen a man temporarily transform into a reptilian while he was changing a tire, but the most interesting case was that of a woman, Barbara who worked in the small town of Dougway as a hairdresser. She worked on many of the base personnel there. On one occasion a customer who was a high-ranking military officer at the base came in. While she was working on his hair, she noticed a brief transformation during which she saw the officer turn into a reptilian creature. Kansas, a Salt Lake City-based ufologist, claims that during an open-mind UFO gathering in the early 1990s, Barbara alleged that while working at Dougway she heard rumors that reptilian humanoids were operating all over the base. Another former Dougway worker, Ray White, who was a top secret courier, stated that during his work at the base 1960s to 1970s, he witnessed an experiment where an object was teleported from one room to another. He also noticed that high-ranking Russian officers sometimes visited the base. He also claimed that some of the people that he met there were not human. When asked what he thought they were, he did not know, but he did mention that top secret research into advanced robotics was being carried out at the base, Branton. Researcher Val Valerian has, incidentally, described a very similar event. Valerian has researched alien phenomena and interaction with human beings since 1969. He spent 18 months in Southeast Asia from 1970 to 71 as a combat photographer where he saw much UFO activity. After spending four years in England from 1980 to 1984 he gathered all the top research at his disposal and released what became known as the Krill Papers, forerunner of the 381-page book, The Matrix, published in 1987. He began networking with researchers worldwide and started an organization known as Nevada Aerial Research Group. Between 1988 and 1989 he functioned as Nevada State Section Director for Muffin. In 1990 he was appointed Interim Associate Director for UFO Contact Center International and was a member of the Aerial Phenomenon Research Organization. In 1988 NER began issuing a small newsletter detailing research findings. By 1990, this newsletter became known as The Leading Edge and has grown to a monthly 100-page publication. The massive 581-page work entitled Matrix 2 was released in 1990. In April of 1991, NER moved to Washington State and was renamed as Leading Edge Research Group. Valerian has a degree both in civil engineering and psychology and had significant input into Nippon television investigations on alien activities, the research that stimulated the production of the 1989 class award-winning program entitled UFOs, The Best Evidence. F.W. Holliday, in his book The Dragon and the Disc, W.W. W. Norton & Company, Incorporated New York, 
New York 1973 relates some unusual facts concerning the relationship between serpent or dragon legends and the modern UFO phenomena. Satanism, that is to say the religion of the dragon, seems to have been contemporaneous in Babylon and Bronze Age Britain. In both countries it was probably practiced by minority groups and became official only in times of decadence. When Cyrus occupied her, a form of dragon worship seems to have been in vogue. The priests of this cult escaped the Persians by fleeing north with their pontiff or pontifex Maximus, a position which has allegedly been secretly held in an unbroken chain from Babylon up to modern times, Branton, into the mountains of Asia Minor. They finally came to rest at a place called Pergamos in Lydia, western Turkey, and there set up a religious center which became known as Satan's Seat. St. John said, And to the angel of the church of Pergamos, write, these things saith he, God, which hath the sharp sword with two edges, judgment and mercy, I know they works, and where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seat is. The Romans also knew about Satan's seat and annexed IT into their empire in 133 before Christ, after the death of Attalus III, the last of the Pergamite kings. About this period a plague broke out in Rome and prayers were offered to the Roman gods in vain. It was decided, therefore, to appeal to Satan at Pergamos. The symbol of the cult was a serpent and a special ship was sent to Lydia to transport the god to Rome. Most likely a depiction or idol representation of the god, in that idols among early pagans were indistinguishable from the so-called gods themselves, Branton. There it was installed as a deity with great pomp. The disease had probably run its course and the resulting improvement in public health was attributed to Satan. The new religion was so popular that snakes of an offensive species were allowed to glide around at parties, at least so Seneca says. In Historia Augusta they are called draconculi or little dragons. The Esculapian serpent, as the god was called, is shown on the carving at Pompeii and is unlike anything known to her petologists. It had vertical humps and snail-like horns, exactly like the monsters sea serpents, Branton of Scotland and Ireland. A bronze Urarian cauldron in Rome carries the erect head and neck of the creature model in the round. It is hideous. It has a shovel-like mouth, bulging eyes and tentacles or sensory organs hanging on each side of the face. No one, of course, thought that snakes were dragons. The malignant great serpent of Babylonia was Typhon or Titan, Satan, the author of wickedness. Politicians, however, never look a gift horse in the mouth as long as it produces results. After giving the Roman people carnage in the guise of circus entertainment, there was no reason for the emperors to shrink from a little devil worship. Even the national flag was given the treatment. Ammianus Marcellinus describes the standard purpurum signum draconis. And when Julius Caesar appeared in full regalia as the Pontifex Maximus he was dressed in reddish purple robes the same as the Pergamite dragon priests. The reader can trace the rest of the story in Gibbon's rise and fall of the Roman Empire. Dragon worship persisted long after Christianity and also Catholicism. Branton had been proclaimed. Churchillian complained, these heretics magnify the serpent to such a degree as to prefer him even to Christ himself. For he, they say, gave us the first knowledge of good and evil. There is a case to be argued that monsters and U.F.O.S are in some way linked. Abnormal chains of causation tending to frustrate inquiry into the nature of the phenomena have been reported in both cases. John A. Keel, an American journalist who has been delving into the mystery for over 30 years, talks about a conspiracy. He warned me, proceed with great caution in your Loch Ness work. We are caught up in a series of games which must be played by their rules. Anyone who tries to invent his own rules, or breaks the basic pattern, soon loses his mind or even his life. Those who think that this is dramatic and absurd may care to remember the words of St. John, and he doth great wonders so that he maketh fire to come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men and deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast. The beast that performed these miracles was what the Jews called the Shining One, the Great Serpent and Satan. If this is the underlying truth of the phenomena then Kiel's warning is by no means too strong. In relation to the above, during the dark ages of Roman rule, Early Dracologists documented many accounts of battles between knights and dragons or winged and limbed serpents. This infestation, as it was called by the early chroniclers, was allegedly halted with the advent of the spread of Christianity, and the worms, as they were often referred to, were forced to retreat back into the underworld, from which they had emerged, by Christian knights such as St. George and Lancelot, 
who vanquished the beasts at every turn. In Popular Science, March 1990 issue, p. 24, we read of an apparently quite intelligent, predatory lizard which constantly walked upright on two legs in a remarkable human-like manner, counterbalanced by a tail. This lizard, in fact, may have been the original ancestor of all the reptilian species throughout this world and beyond. If left to its natural course of not so much evolution, but rather mutation over the years, according to some paleontologists, a race of creatures such as described below might have, through natural selection and environmental adaptation, become more intelligent and hominoid in nature. As its brain and physical form developed, and its limbs became stronger through survival of the fittest, the tails of such a predatory race may have become atrophied as the limbs became atrophied in snakes, a reptilian branch that apparently mutated in the opposite direction. The article states, the oldest known dinosaur, Horirosaurus, was a flyweight when compared with some of its ponderous descendants. Horirosaurus weighed perhaps 300 pounds and stretched a mere 6 to 8 feet long. It had enormous claws and small forelimbs, showing that it spent much time ambling on two legs. It also had a peculiar, double-hinged jaw that allowed it to clamp down on wriggling prey. And its teeth were finely serrated. These characteristics clearly mark Horirosaurus as an active flesh-eater. The site of the fossil find of the remains of this Saurian, Branton, the Ice Chigalisto Formation in northwestern Argentina, is the only area in the world where there are no gaps in the fossil record across the time zone being investigated. In reference to the discoveries made by researcher Paul Serrano, a paleontologist at the University of Chicago, who with colleague Alfredo Minetti discovered some remains of the bipedal sorbioid lizard near San Juan, Argentina, the article states, Serrano says that the very first dinosaur should have lived at the time of the rock layer containing Horirosaurus, but that climate and geological factors combined to keep any fossils from being preserved there. We'll have to concentrate above and below that zone, says Serrano. Fortunately, those layers are very good. It's likely we'll be able to find more interesting fossils there. The paleontologist won the $500,000 Packard Foundation Award last October which he says will enable him to continue on the track of dinosaurs. The following is apparently a description of the nefarious activities of the Sorian Gray entities, which was submitted to us along with a miscellaneous collection of UFO data by a Mr. Ray White. We do not know its original source, other than the apparent fact that the information seems to be based on the revelations of a certain abductee, and begins by making reference to the Grays as being eaters of souls, harvesters of souls, placed in huge globular depositories, something extracted, as hemoglobin is extracted from blood, some residue buried in a graveyard not on this planet. Couldn't move or speak, couldn't move head, tunnel vision, everything blurred except straight ahead, they have rank, like an army but not the same, you know by the way they talk to each other, thumb, three fingers, perhaps one very small, suction pads on tips of fingers, our eyes do not pick up the real color of their skin. Only a color-blind person would see their skin as it really is, she saw them as grayish-green, their skin is not their true skin, it is like a shield they use, a protective covering, their perception of pain is different from ours, one had compassion dash dash note, in a similar manner Kenneth Ring, Ph.D. in his book The Omega Project, William Morrow and Company, New York 1972, states that, based on abductee reports, the opaque black eyes of most of the grays may also be artificial coverings. Branton, note, in most cases the only grays described as having compassion are the so-called hybrids, most of which are actually humans conceived from human semen and overtaken from abductees, yet which have been genetically altered through biotechnology and or artificial postnatal gene spicing with the aliens or other life forms. Just as the grays are allegedly part of a lower sorbioid hierarchy, the hybrids or hubrides are reportedly the slave workers who work under them, Branton. Dash dash others did not, ship blended into rock, total camouflage, have instruments that can camouflage ships as, like, army vehicles, when she entered the ship, at first she thought that she was going into a cave in the rocks, they take off your clothes right away, without your realizing they have done it, they have a section strictly for men, another strictly for women, they did not understand her menstruating. She had to explain menstrual periods to female alien, cure of cancer in spices and roots, deformed babies in some sort of liquid, some ET, some human, some ET slash human, some deformed baby animals, failed experiments, 
They have not yet had luck in interbreeding with us. Offspring survive a certain amount of time, but then die. They're metal different from ours, soft but not soft. They don't understand how we bruise so easily, the softness of our skin. They were interested in soft spot at top of skull. They told her about her family history, going way back, always the terrible things, traumatic childhood memories, few seconds each, the things she had blocked out, never the happy memories. They can't understand why we aren't more advanced than they are. We limit ourselves, block knowledge out, ringing in ears both on and off ship, calf alive but frozen, different types of samples of animal life. They give birth through navel, not vagina, Uberin. Starmaster 12 single quote tall, night of lights when everyone will see it, the whole world. On October 16, 1992, Fox Network's sightings documentary described several abduction experiences involving greys and larger reptilian entities. One woman alleged that during one encounter with the reptilian greys she saw a praying mantis type of creature working with the saurian greys and which seemed to be the leader. It had huge black eyes and even through the woman despised the greys she felt an even stronger disgust and hatred for that particular creature. This is not the only case where reptile saurian predators and insectoid parasites, as some have referred to them, have been seen working together. Just what are these mantis-like creatures that have been seen working with the greys reptilians? Some have suggested that they are an extreme mutation of the reptilian race, while others suggest they are interdimensional entities of insectoid configuration. John Lear has alleged that one of the first crash retrievals of an unidentified aerial disc involved these mantis-like creatures which were found on board. However he also states that within a short period following the inside and all of the high government officials who investigated that particular case died under mysterious circumstances. Such a coincidence may seem sinister if not demoniacal in nature. Like the reptilians themselves. These mantis-like creatures have usually been described as being deadly and very deceptive and abusive. It seems as if they operate on an equal basis, and in some cases a superior basis to the so-called reptilian and sauroid gray alien groups and possibly the turodactoids or so-called mothman as well. One source, although unconfirmed, claimed to have seen huge mantis-like creatures in a cavern deep below a drill shaft south of the Kokawif mountain area near the Mojave Desert. The account rather obscure in some details, was related by way of a Mr. Stoles who knew some individuals who were involved in modern attempts to break into Earl Dor's legendary underground Grand Canyon or River of Gold beneath Kokawif Peak. It is uncertain whether the man in question was lowered down the hole or whether he allegedly saw the creatures via camera equipment that was lowered down the drill shaft. In his book The Serpent and the Satellite, Philosophical Library, New York, author F. Alfred Marin reveals on page 343, in the Jewish legends the serpent is sometimes described as a modified reptilian human-like creature indicating that this description was also gradually evolving into the symbolism of wickedness or Satan into the image and likeness of a man. The Leading Edge Research Group, P.O. Box 481-MU58, Yelm, Washington 98587, published the following advertisements or introductions for two of their publications. Although these publications contain some occult-channeled metaphysical information of a rather unsubstantiated or subjective nature, other information arrive from more down-to-earth and thus more substantiating or objective sources. The first ad is as follows, Valerian, Valdemar. Matrix 2, The Abduction and Manipulation of Humans Using Advanced Technology. Third edition. Updated with new material. Leading Edge Research Group, 1991, 8 and 1 half x 11. Velo binding, 660 pages, 1400 line item index. Its first two editions sold out planetwide as of June 1990. It is rumored that some alien species have secured a copy, and though the United States government has also apparently acquired it. The original Matrix, issued in 1988, set the stage for this incredible piece of work. The book, now in its third edition, updated in July 1991, encompasses an incredible range of data which includes precedental research on human abduction by both government and off-planet forces, material that other authors will not speak of and what publishers will not allow themselves to print. After the book was released, other researchers began to catch on to what has been occurring. Val Valerian weaves a wide range of interrelated material into a literary experience that will rock you to the core of your being, included within the book is Data and updates on underground bases at Dulce and the Nevada test site, a large number of illustrations, 
maps and charts detailing activity sites, underground installations and tunnel networks, commentary by John Lear, Robert Lazar and a host of other top-notch researchers. Valerian takes us through the whole gambit of how, why, and by whom humans are manipulated, information about government connections to the abduction process, post-abduction problems, and things that the abductee can do. The book is the first to adequately relate research on memory functions relative to the abduction process, virtual reality machines and Riken programming, and mind control by human and alien manipulators. It also discusses the abduction of human children and how to handle adjustment of the child to the experience, multi-generational scenarios and cases, human multi-dimensional anatomy and how it can be manipulated by technology and elements of advanced technology possessed by the government. There is more information about the various species known as the Greys in Matrix 2 than there has been or probably ever will be published anywhere. There is additional data on the reptilian species who are dominant over the Greys and what they may have planned for humans in the coming years. There are overviews of the processes and rationale for implanting humans as well as cross-sections in technical data gleaned from extracted alien implants during 1991. Electronic space societies which the Earth will become in the near future are discussed. The book has an incredible spectrum of information about alien influence on human society, historical facts that are hard to come by, and much much more. There is just so much data in this book that it would take pages and pages to describe it. The book is the death knell for the planetary domination based control systems, the whole domination slash control game and its accompanying social manifestations and what is ultimately behind them are exposed for all to see. Matrix 2 and the research of Valerian and others he includes in his book also spells the end for classical ufology with its attendant ufologists, experts, and most of the UFO organizations that are here today. It also exposes techniques that intelligence and security forces used to have influence over people and teaches you why they are doing it. Through the book, we can see how alien interaction has affected wave after wave of civilization on this planet, injecting elements of adverse technology and mind control, and how the suppression of human awareness is being performed and supported. Matrix 2 is an absolute must to have in your library, you might throw all your other books on the subject away. And then the following ad, which may seem rather confusing at first, however when compared with the rest of this file as a whole, one will begin to see how the following information corroborates with that which other sources have related, Orion-based technology, mind control and other secret projects, a series of conducted interviews, 53 PG, $8, this 53-page report was constructed from over 9 hours of video interviews, personal interviews and individual commentary. It is structured in an open question-answer format in such a way that the identities of the different parties are protected. This was requested by several of the parties in order to permit this piece of work to be done and disseminated. It took approximately 20 hours of work to create the report, which contains information about some of the following topics, the Philadelphia Experiment, or Project Rainbow, Phoenix Projects 1-3, origins of the radio sound and connections with the work of Wilhelm Reich, government weather control programs and hidden agenda, the Montauk Mind Control Projects the deliberate murder of thousands of American children and mind control research and time tunnel experiments, government time tunnel projects and operational procedures, how Nikola Tesla and von Neumann contributed to these projects, the martyrdom clause, mind control by individual signature, technical ways to produce planetary holograms and matria effects, government rationale and plans for the confinement camps and slave labor, Project Dream Scan, Project Moon Scan, the Airborne Instrument Labs, Project Mind Wrecker, the alien group known as the Kondrashkin and their interaction with the United States government mind control programs, the Kamigal 2 and Gizzi groups, the negative Syrians, Soviet scalar weaponry, Orion group manipulations, telepathy producing drugs and their use and suppression, the Fawn Zero Time Generators, technical spin-offs from the Philadelphia Project, the International Aerospace Alliance, cross-section of implant device, Wilhelm Reich and mind control. Riken orgastic type programming and its use by the, the United States government and Syrians, the Seacor, alien soul trading, Montauk and the aliens from the Antares system, the Leverons, the, the United States government and the Greys, electronic life support systems of the reptilian humanoids, new life form masses over the poles and their relation to yearly outbreaks of flu-like disease, AIDS and Fort Detrick, NSA, maglev trains and the, the United States underground tunnel network, the missing human genes, Buried spacecraft and alien technical archives under the Giza Pyramid, 
the coming new money, the black nobility, Nordic and human copper-based blood systems and physiology, the technology of cloning and development of synthetic humans and political replacement programs, the Middle East situation, congressional awareness of drug and alien agenda, the MIB, the, the United States Army and the black helicopter forces, government mobile mind disruption technology, nature and purpose of the Orion group, fourth density transmutation of the human race, geological changes, Syrian mind control technology, and more, along with illustrations gleaned from witnesses with photographic memory and a lot of courage. Again, in reference to the serpent races, John A. Keel, in his book Our Haunted Planet, 1968. Fawcett Publications. Greenwich, Connecticut has stated, The parahuman serpent people of the past are still among us. They were probably worshipped by the builders of Stonehenge and the forgotten ridge-making cultures of South America. In some parts of the world the serpent people successfully posed as gods and imitated the techniques of the superintelligence. This led to the formation of pagan religions centered around human sacrifices. The conflict, so far as man himself was concerned, became one of religions and races. Whole civilizations based upon the worship of these false gods rose and fell in Asia, Africa, and South America. The battleground had been chosen, and the mode of conflict had been decided upon. The human race would supply the puns. The mode of control was complicated as usual. Human beings were largely free of direct control. Each individual had to consciously commit himself to one of the opposing forces. The main battle was for what was to become known as the human soul. Once an individual had committed himself, he opened the door so that an indefinable something could actually enter his body and exercise some control over his subconscious mind. Note, according to Judeo-Christian teaching, this would either be the incorruptible spirit of the Messiah or the soul-destroying spirit of Antichrist, the serpent, Satan, etc. Just as nature hates a vacuum, so does the human soul and spirit. In other words, what Kiel is saying is that the human spirit cannot work entirely of its own volition, but must serve as a channel or a vessel of a higher power, whether that power is good or evil. The act of free will which is given to man is a choice over which of these powers to submit to or serve, and to accept personal responsibility for that choice. It is the greatest presumption to believe that finite beings like ourselves can choose to be neutral in this ancient battle between the angelic forces of light and life, and the fallen demoniacal powers of darkness and death. Neither side will allow for neutral territory, in this case human souls, because the stakes in this cosmic conflict are too high, Branton. The serpent people or Omega group, attacked man in various ways, trying to rid the planet of him but the superintelligence was still able to look over Mon. God worked out new ways of communication and control, always in conflict with the serpent people. The mysterious government insider whose books have been published by Tim Beckley's Abelard Press of New York, Commander X, related a very interesting incident which involved the subterranean mega-complex beneath Dulce, New Mexico. The story he tells might turn out to be an important part of the overall puzzle in connection with that which has previously been related. One of the many accounts concerning this particular alien stronghold, an underground empire which is apparently attempting to spread its borders to the Mojave, where they have met resistance from relatively more benevolent human forces, was related by this anonymous intelligence worker, who states, In another case an old illustrator, John D., does very painstaking work, but during his being on active duty at Dulcie he began to act very queerly. He would write letters to the president informing him of a plot underway to undermine the government, and to sabotage the base. He began to draw pictures of American flags, beautifully executed. He drew strange designs of mechanical devices, began to visit the library and bring back books on physics and advanced electronics. He hardly knew how to spell the words 